date, the month and when to put this on, and all this really came up as an ideal month. And wonderful talks come in and you know we realized that we couldn't have that relaxed schedule everyone for you know keeping the energy levels up and being a part of that so this is um, the fourth and final day um, of Starship Congress um, and so we've got a couple of exciting things going on today we've got a keynote speech by Stefan uh, as well as uh, announcement of certain prizes we're also going to be announcing the Alpha Centauri prize winner um, a little later today um, we've got a few talks uh, in the morning and uh, the afternoon session is going to be largely d uh, dedicated to some of uh, articulating to you guys some of the programs and projects that specifically Icarus Interstellar is involved in. So, for example, we're going to have a panel up here um, with, the, uh, with some of the project leads uh, where they're going to explain to you where they want to take their projects over the next couple of years um, and, and really open it up to you guys if you have, um, if you have any questions. So um, we're going to start in about seven minutes. And if anyone has seen Rob Swinney, Eric Davis would like to see him. Yeah, we need Rob's slides. <laughs> Rob Swinney, he's not here yet.
everyone. Thank you for bearing through four days of stimulating conversation, various events, and uh, as we come up to our fourth day, I think you will find that the people who chose to take the later flights uh, will be thoroughly rewarded. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome Stéphane Martinier to give us our keynote this morning. Stéphane is a French artist who is act lives here in Dallas, uh, in fact, now. He's uh, been absolutely remarkable the, the way that he has contributed to, to this conference. He's helped us organize the, the Farm Maker Awards and uh, has shown us really what uh, the caliber of his, uh, of his work is. Uh, Hugo, um, Stefan has been uh, involved in some fascinating projects other than book illustrations and, and uh, um, the movies that, uh, that he's been involved in uh, are, some of the, are, are some that have captured our imagination from uh, The Astronaut's Wife, Battlefield Earth, Dragonheart, He's worked on uh, The Fifth Element, which uh, I personally can watch every single time it's on television. I cannot, I cannot stop watching it. Uh, I, Robot, and uh, the rumor is, Stefan can, can confirm that, that he's working on, on Phoenix Rising, which is a revival of Captain Power. And if you haven't seen Captain Power, then go watch the old ones, and then you can, we can see what the new ones are. Stefan uh, was has won multiple awards. He's uh, I just picked a couple: the British Science Fiction Association Award and the Hugo Award for Best Professional Artist in 2008. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome Stefan Martinier to speak to us about his origins. Thank you. Good morning, and and thank you for coming and listen to me for about 40 minutes. Uh, uh, like uh, Andreas mentioned, I've been in that industry now for over 30 years, and I've been working as an artist, concept artist, and art director, as well as a director, in pretty much every field of the entertainment industry, from animation to film to theme parks, and doing book covers and publishings and things like that. So it's been really uh, uh, an interesting ride for me, and very, very creative at the same time. Uh, I wanted to uh, share with you today uh, my career over these 30 years and make a parallel with that with some really interesting dates and events, scientific achievements that have happened as I was growing up, which also shaped my, my life and my career, which I thought was, was kind of interesting. Uh, so the title, when I grow up, when I want to be, uh, when I grow up, I want to be an astronaut, uh, really started very early on when I, when I was a, a kid. So I thought that would be a good, a good way to start the whole thing. Uh, the reason I'm here today is because of these two particular images: this one here of a colony ship, and this one of the Icarus spaceship reaching a distant stars. And these images were commissioned a couple of years ago by the National Geographic. And this one here was actually an idea from the National Geographic of revamp the, 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 the idea of what a colony ship would be. And it just happened that there hadn't been any new uh, take on uh, uh, illustrations uh, for, that, for that particular concept. So everything that they had and they had for a long time was these paintings from the 60s. And they thought, you know, with all these new generation of artists have been you know, working in the field, it would be interesting to kind of ask one of them, namely me, to give a fresh look at what my vision of a colony ship would be. So I was given all the information about what had been done in the past and who had worked on this concept and came up with these wild ideas about what it could be uh, and, and, and do these, these big illustrations and, and spread for National Geographic. And which is the reason why I was invited here. Since you know that image came out, I was asked to participate to that particular event, since it is totally 
you know, in tune with what, what is being discussed here and has been discussed for the last four days. So I thought that was really, really great. And I usually attend, you know, these science fiction conventions. So uh, to me, it was really a, an interesting opportunity to hear the hard science, the, the science behind the science fiction that I usually read all the time and, and get a sense about, you know, the, 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 uh, the speculations and, 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 and the thinking that, that, that is happening and has been happening for, for quite a while. So it was very exciting for me to be here and listen to some of the talks, you know, over the last several days. So how did that all start? Uh, well, in 1962, uh, I was born. And interestingly enough, as I'm coming into the world, uh, 1962 was also the, the year when John Glenn orbited the Earth. So that was maybe, you know, an interesting timing, but I thought, you know, this is a good star here. So, <laughs> so as I'm starting to grow, it, it, it became quickly, you know, like every kid draws, you know, and I'm drawing also as well, you know, it's, and maybe because of that event and, and because of things that started to happen in the space program, uh, one of the things that came to my mind very quickly is when I grew up, I want to be an astronaut. Uh, and so I started doodling, you know, these little astronauts and, and, and people going to space. And, and of course, you know, one thing leads to another. From astronauts' drawings, I'm starting to design aliens. I'm thinking of aliens. And so it goes from the friendly aliens, you know, to other types of aliens to, of course, the not-so-friendly aliens because kids like to do things that are also very bloody gory. And so I'm kind of growing up slowly. And then... As I'm growing up, you know, in the, in, in the 60s, uh, so around 1968, 70, I'm about eight years old, and I'm being introduced in France to uh, some very important uh, uh, comic books that are going to shape uh, my life uh, come moving forward, as well as some very interesting uh, movies coming out. And so one of them was, was Spiru, and Spiru was a, a magazine uh, filled with you know, wonderful artists uh, that were very uh, comic oriented and very cartoony. So that was one of uh, the side of my career that, that really that I embraced as an artist is doing a lot of things that are very cute and cartoony but at the same time I was also reading another comic book uh, that was really more about science fiction and with wonderful artists you know, that were uh, paving the way for, for some, some really incredible art. And so I was really passionate right away about, about, about both and, and very attracted with you know, the cartoony style as well as the re real or realistic style uh, and, and different subjects like you know, yeah, science fiction. And then you know, this happened as well. And Tintin for me was really a, a, a landmark. Uh, Tintin was this very adventurous young character going into these, these uh, wild adventures. And these particular two albums that were created were actually done even way before we first walked on the moon. And there was already that. And, and that particular artist was very interesting because he always worked with very, very hard data. Every single frame of his comics was based on very, very accurate uh, you know, thinking or drawings. Or, and so everything was, was very real. And, and these two particular stories, one following the other, were, were really uh, amazing to me because that was the start of, you know, going into space, you know, and, and what it would be and, and, and reaching out, out there. And then at the same time as I was reading that, I was also very much into fantasy. So I like these little cutesy, you know, characters. And then uh, around the same time, when I was eight years old, I was introduced to uh, a movie that I was also going to really shaped my, my career, uh, 2001, Space Odyssey. And to me, that, that, that film was absolutely mind-bending. It's like I, I came out of that movie, my dad took me there, and uh, I was almost in a trance. It's like, I was like, what just happened right there? It's just, it's <laughs> like, and, and I had so many questions, because that, that movie raised some very profound questions that I had to get the book and read the book and try to understand what I had just seen. And I've seen that movie now, you know, a dozen times and it's, it's still a classic to me and, and that, that really shaped in terms of the visual that it produced as well as the type of ideas that it brought in and really shaped, you know, a lot of things that I did later on as an artist. And so, surely enough, 1969, a year after that, Apollo Lunar Landing, big, big day for, for, for many people and for me as well. So. As this event happens, 
of course, at the same time, I'm starting to get introduced to movies like The Day of the Earth Stood Still and The Forbidden Planet. And, and then something happens during the, 60s, yeah, the 70s and, and in a couple of years, uh, and I'm calling that colorful spaceships and spandex because something really important happens uh, at this period of time artistically is there was that wonderful artist called Chris Voss that introduced a whole new vision of what spaceship could, could be. And, and if you remember at the time in the 60s and 70s, it was all about shiny rockets and Buck Rogers. And so everything was, was really particular in, in, its, in its own look. And suddenly this guy comes in and, and says, well, space could look like this. And spaceship could look like that. And it was just like a slap in the face for the entire community. It's like, oh my God, I've never seen anything like that. And so and to me, that was also you know, something very, very uh, remarkable and, and, and really shaped right away you know, how I wanted to approach also my own, my own visions, my own designs. And as you can see, you know, he was even really way, way ahead of the curve in terms of even designing ideas that were taken and, and, and inspired Star Wars you know, later on and things like that. And then at the same time as I was discovering Chris Foss and I was getting some, some, a, a better sense about what I wanted to be and how I wanted to, to, to be as an artist, you know, I was also introduced to the whole world of superheroes from, from the United States, namely with two very particular magazines that were published, published in France, uh, one being Strange and the other one being Marvel. And so I became a big fan of the Silver Surfer and Iron Man at the same time as I was doodling these monsters and doing these astronauts and, and trying to get really, really uh, you know, involved in wanting to be a science fiction artist. So all these, these things you know, were kind of like part of my world on a daily basis. And then as I'm continuing you know, to, to grow and, and, and being bombarded with these uh, artistic uh, 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 Informations, 1973, the, the launch of Skylab One, you know, another big, big landmark that that happened as I was growing up, and then 1974 for me at the same time, I'm being introduced to another artist that uh, was also very influential to me called Bernie Wrightson, uh, who did a, uh, a comics called The Swamp Thing, and wonderful, wonderful designs, and incidentally, I became a very good friend later on. Uh, with him and got to work on several projects together. So this was something very, uh, very rewarding for me. Uh, then 1973, Pioneer 10, flyby of Jupiter. So as, as things progress, as I'm growing up, as I'm kind of getting more and more into that, you know, the space program is also advancing in its own, in its own way. Then 1976, Viking 1 lands on Mars. So another landmark. And then also 1976, that's the year I discovered heavy metal and heavy metal also reshaped a lot of things in the industry and got me into a whole new directions of what I could be doing as an artist and, and got me to be influenced in many different ways with artists like Drouillet and, and Mezier and Mobius, uh, which were very, very visionaries at the time. The same way Chris Forrest introduced new ways of, of looking at the future and looking at some spaceship, these artists introduced a whole new way of what science fiction could look like. Uh, and the subject that could be explored and the stories that could be told. And then 1977 happened and Star Wars <coughs> was released. And that also became everything, everything changed. Um, new way of looking at films, new way of looking at the space opera, reintroductions of uh, the big operatic music. And so this also, I was about 14, 15 when that happens. That totally solidified at that point about what I was going to be doing as a career. I knew I wanted to be in a science fiction field. I knew I wanted to draw spaceships and astronauts and aliens, and I wanted to be involved in it. Now, I didn't know exactly yet how, how it was gonna happen, but I knew this is what I was going. So then, one thing leads to another, I'm going to art school, because this is where I have to do. If I wanna be as good as a, a Chris Foss and a Mobius and a Mezier, I have to go and I have to learn the trade. So art school, obviously, you know, have to learn all the basic foundations, anatomy and perspective and all the, the good stuff. And the idea is, of course, to become a Michelangelo, or at least to be as good as one. But, you know, it's like it's not always very easy. So sometimes, you know, you have difficulties and the art is not always what you want. And sometimes it's pretty disastrous as well. But, you know, you have to go. You go with the flow. You learn. You learn the ropes. And, you know, you get better and better. 
And as I'm st starting to learn the craft, uh, 1979, Alien gets get released, and boom, another landmark film for me about a whole new way of, of looking at science fiction, uh, introducing the, the greedy and the dirty, the kind of blue color in space. Uh, it's not Buck Rogers anymore. It's, it's really a new vision about what it could be sending people out there. And of course, you know, with the drama of an alien story and monsters, just to create something interesting. And then Star Trek. Star Trek happened, and to me it was also very important too because I was in France, so Star Trek didn't have a popularity in France that it has in the States. So I didn't know anything about the TV series that was already going on that was extremely popular here. I, was, I discovered Star Trek by the first movie that, 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 that was made. And to me, Star Trek, the movie was, was interesting, was fun, uh, but really what, what, what Mark what was really important in there is the visual vision of that particular ship in there. And, and that imagery for at least five minutes of movies was absolutely stunning. Uh, the, 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 the vision behind that object that grew in space that was launched and come back to Earth and has gathered all these things and comes back to meet the maker was incredible. I thought the idea was brilliant, and, and I thought the look of that particular ship was, was really incredible. And that, to me, got me really, really excited. Uh, and then as I'm learning and continue to learn, 1981, the space shuttle's first flight. You know, things are happening also. People are just doing wonderful things. And then 1981, my first flight, and I'm going to Japan. So now I'm kind of like finishing my, my last years of art school, and I'm being sent to Japan to work on Inspector Gadget. Uh, so it's one of the things I was doing. I was learning animations as well as I was doing a lot of things, and this was my first job. First job, sending to Japan. And of course, you know, going to Japan, me and I have never been out of France. I'm envisioning Japan as, you know, these beautiful sceneries and these old houses and the blossoming of the cherry trees and stuff. And of course, I'm getting there and I'm getting these. And I have absolutely no idea, and I'm totally unprepared, and I'm, 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 I'm seeing this. And this is Japan. This is Japan, I'm this, you know, it happens. And then this, you know, this is also a new, a new culture. And it's a culture shock at the same time. And of course, you know, this as well, introduced to new things. And of course, Japan is a very crowded place, so it's also very scary. It's like people by the thousands in, on the streets. And sometimes this happens as well, and it's very scary. But I'm being told, you know, it's okay, don't worry, because you know it's worse in India. So at least you're in a good place. So, so, so it's good. And then I'm being introduced to new things that I had never seen before. So I'm, I'm discovering Godzilla, and then the samurai movies. And so that also started to shape my career as well, because I was part of my world. And I discovered that a lot of, thing, lot, lot of things that were happening in Japan uh, were not actually necessarily known anywhere else but Japan. So I was fortunate enough to be there at a young age to discover anime and these kind of very unique movies and that these new vi vision, you know, that were coming from, from the East. And so then I take a short break and I come back to France after Inspector Gadget and then 1982 Blade Runner comes out. And boom, another movie that completely changed everything in terms of how, you know, you can also tell a story and, and how you could view science fictions, you know, and how, you know, the whole concept of these, you know, uh, you know, um, of these characters, you know, coming back to Earth and uh, the concept of robots and space explorations and, and cloning people and creating, you know, people to do the work we can do in space and things like that. So be all these very interesting ideas uh, with that kind of style, very, uh, very, uh, very interesting looking. And then 1983, uh, as I'm uh, starting my career and I've worked now on Inspector Gadget, the company sends me to Los Angeles. And also my first time in the States, so I have also no idea. So I'm envisioning, you know, sunny days and, you know, beautiful sceneries. And of course what I'm getting, in, you know, the smog and the traffic, you know, and Big Bob and stuff. I'm introduced to the burger. And so, you know, I'm learning again another culture and that's also a good thing. I'm learning new things and I'm, and I'm working on Heathcliff. I'm being sent there to work on that little cartoon of that kind of little quirky little cat doing, you know, mischievous things all the time. And that's also another side of, you know, the, the kind of career that I was doing in the animation industry. And then, as I'm doing all that, 81, from 86 to 89, new things happen. Voyager 2 reaches Saturn and Uranus and Neptune. 
and so things also are now progressing you know further in space and that's also getting very exciting at the same time and then 1989 the abyss and also another another subject about encountering an alien race and what it could be and in that particular case you know something on the water that was a beautiful movie and a very interesting take about you know, our first contact, you know, with another civilization, uh, and then not necessarily, you know, um, from out of space. You know, that was really, really cool. And then I'm being introduced to another artist that was very influential to me, uh, John Berkey. And John Berkey came up also with his visions of spaceships that were absolutely marvelous and, and very unique. I've never, never seen any, anyone doing spaceship like that, coming up with this very, very weird looking shape and, 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 and wonderful, you know, ideas. At the same time as I was discovering him, you know, I was also discovering McCall, who was doing a lot of space paintings and some of them for NASA, a beautiful painter. And then John Harris. John Harris also was uh, an English painter uh, that came in the 70s, was doing these very, very simple and beautiful paintings. So all these people, you know, were part of my career and, 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 and my life and so were influ influencing me as I was getting better and better in a professional field. And in Los Angeles is also where I met my wife. Now I didn't marry Barbarella, uh, but my wife is as beautiful as Barbarella. So, and then of course, you know, it was love at first sight and we get married. And, uh, and so Los Angeles was, was really important to me because as I'm getting married, then I know I'm going to be staying there. And so this also at the same time as I make the decision to now start my career and stay there for a while, uh, 1990 is also the launch of a Hubble telescope. So, so that was kind of interesting that when I'm making this decision, these things are happening at the same time. And then, so these are the years I'm going to be working mainly in cartoons and theme parks for many years, and that's also going to be the year where the landing of Pathfinder on Mars. So that's also happening and that's wonderful. So I'm kind of doing all these wonderful things and then I'm seeing this happening in a space program and that's also as exciting. And then that's also the year of, the, of where I'm landing my first film job and that's gonna be a big portion of my career there moving forward. And my first thing, my, my first movie being the fifth element. Uh, and so it's, you know, the movie industry is like any other industry, it's like a snowball effect. You know, you start with one project and if you do a good job and people like what you do, then they'll call and you work on a second one. And so as I'm moving along and starting to establish the career in the movie industry, also a lot of things are happening in a space program and then also other things are happening in space and Haley Bob shows up and I was fortunate enough to be able to have a look at it. So that was also very exciting and I was fortunate to be high up in the mountains having a very clear sky to be able to see it very, very clearly and that was pretty exciting. Uh, and I was also the year of a space station. So another landmark of, of achievement that was really exciting to see happening. Um, and then, you know, during these years, 98, that's the, the year I worked on Sphere. So as the space station is being built up, up there, I'm also working on another kind of station on the water. Uh, and it's always interesting to me the parallel between what's happening in space and the space program and all these movies that I'm working on. And it's also very intriguing to me that, you know, it's like on one way on the science side, everything tends to uh, go towards a very uh, optimistic future. And I'm working on all these movies that are more about catastrophes and disasters. And so I always I kind of find a parallel very, very, very amusing. So I'm working on several movies like this as the year progresses, and 1999 is the year I worked on Virus virus where I designed these very monstrous ugly creatures another one of these movies with first contact that goes wrong uh, which ties to the presentation yesterday which was actually very interesting about you know should we really meet E.T. if we had the chance and you know the more we talk about it the more we should say no we should, maybe we shouldn't and these things can happen you know I mean so that's one of the scenarios that could be really you know ugly for us uh, and then I also work on The Astronaut's Wife, another scenario with a first contact that goes wrong. Uh, very interesting movie, low budget, but very cool, where I got to design the, the creature, and this time it's more of an energy type creature. Uh, and then Red Planet, worked on Red Planet, designing also some of the ships and some of the creatures and some of the environments on this. And then The Time Machine, uh, also designing a lot of the environment, you know, working on the machine itself, you know, wonderful story. I was very fortunate to work on that because I was a big fan of the of book itself. And then Star Wars. And Star Wars for me was really important because I grew up and at 15 I got to be 
there when the first movie was released, never thinking that 20 years later I would be one of the artists working on the new series coming out. So that was really, really rewarding for me to have grown professionally to such a, a level that now I could be part of the legacy and what also shaped my career and be now shaping, you know, and maybe influential and being inspiring other generations of new artists the same way that these movies, you know, shaped my, my career. And so these are the things that I did on the Star Wars project, some of the robots and creatures, some of the environments for Coruscant. I've worked on the last two Star Wars, so there was a lot of work there. Uh, and then 2004, I worked on iRobot, another you know, beautiful story and, and an incredible project where I got to design cityscapes and the whole you know, futuristic city and how it would look like, you know, kind of like 100 years in the future and kind of project that you know, with a story that's, that's behind it. And then another movie that was very intriguing to me was Knowing. Knowing was a, also another a doomsday scenario about a solar flare that could just kill us and what could happen and then the, the introductions of this particular being that are raising also some very interesting questions and, and I was asked here in a very challenging project because uh, the, the director wanted to be able to transfer the idea that these beings could be either or and so it was very important that they don't necessarily are too much uh, of, of a religious nature but at the same time, too, not too much on a scientific nature as well. So let the audience decide what they are and try to kind of go from there and, and kind of open up a discussion. And there was a lot of discussion actually that happened after that movie came up as to you know what, what you just seen and what are these aliens and, and where do they come from? And are, are they really our interpretation of and are they, where they are at the origin of our religion and, and all these kind of interesting things. That, and it was very intriguing to me to work on that and I really enjoyed it. And then I worked in 2010 in Tron Legacy, another very interesting project about, you know, rethinking, you know, a universe, you know, that's, that's different and that's, that's very, very, uh, you know, visual. Uh, and then recently, 2012, Total Recall, and another one of these, you know, big projects where I have to design a lot of the environments and cityscapes and try to come up with new ways of thinking about what cities of the future could be, uh, you know, in, a, in different worlds or on Earth or an Earth-like type scenario, uh, doing these, these incredible environments and machineries. Uh, and then, at the same time as, as I was doing a career in the book cover industry, I mean in a film industry, I was also starting a, a whole career in the book cover. And I've, I've been reading science fiction for many, many years. And so I was familiar with all these, these interesting stories and scenarios. And so it was, it was really exciting to me to get to illustrate some of these writers to, uh, you know, and, and many of these writers are actually scientists as well. So it's interesting that I'm here even today, you know, because it's part of, you know, the world that, that, that I gravitate around. And so it's very exciting to be part of you know, the side of the science and the side of the fictions and, and be part of both and, and being able to participate and, and, and share my vision as an artist, you know, to, to all, these, all these different subjects. And so these are some of the covers I'm going to show you very briefly about how I envision, you know, futures and, and, and the, kind of, uh, uh, the kind of illustrations that are being asked of me and, and the kind of vision that I can bring to the field in terms of what could be if we are there, out there in space, what could be if we colonize a planet, and this one in particular was about that, a new ways of colonizing, you know, a planet, how we, terra how we, we terraform, you know, an environment, and, and how things would happen. And it's always interesting doing book covers, because there's always a story behind. So there's a lot of, always a lot of drama, and so, you know, you work with that, and you try to envision, you know, the, the, the whole scenario with, with, with what it could look like architecturally and, and, and the habitats and the spaceships themselves. And so I always find that very fascinating. Uh, and then sometimes it goes real wild, you know, in terms of thinking just, just out of the box, what could be interesting things that could be shaped and that could be there, you know, visually just, just to inspire, just to get your mind going and, and get, get questions out of that. Uh, you know, other covers like first encounters with an alien race that comes from outer space that's, uh, that's based on a squid-like evolution, you know, that was a very interesting story. Um, you know, uh, stories about, you know, uh, also first contact, you know, during, during the different times and then 
things like like uh, you know uh, stations and, and habitats on different planets, uh, and then envisioning things that have been talked about in terms of these very very elaborate uh, you know disk in space gravitational. Uh, gravitational stations that uh, could be enormous in size, almost like a colony ship. So different ideas, you know, behind that. Uh, and then life on Mars, you know, life on Mars and how we would colonize that and, and what it could look like and different types of rockets. And, and of course, you know, what can some forms of life look like? Uh, you know, so there was also stories and other types of, you know, structures and, and spaceships. Uh, and then, of course, sometimes, you know, what would be if, if anything, you know, so designing this shape purely for the beauty of a shape and see, you know, if it inspires and, 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 and raise some, some interesting questions and then how we would, you know, uh, reshape our universe, you know, reshape planetary systems, how we'd be able to, uh, you know, uh, pull things. I mean, we've been talking yesterday about, you know, how to go and collect these asteroids and bring them to be able to mine them, you know, that's is a vision of how maybe, you know, these things could happen and how the spaceship could look like. Uh, different covers about, you know, uh, rocket ships taking off and, and different ideas. Um, this was an interesting one as well, based on actually some scenarios about solar sails, giant solar sails that would power spaceships in space, you know, so it's a much closer, closer science, fiction, uh, science fiction idea, but it's also been, you know, explored as well, you know, in terms of science, and so it was interesting to me to kind of get a visual to that, see what it would, would look like. And then, you know, what, uh, what life out there in different worlds could look like. I was always fascinated about, you know, what could be and the possibilities of life and, and, and you know, what it would look like, you know, and always try to see it from, from a different perspective about, you know, it's like, would it be a happy place? Would it be not a happy place? Uh, kind of could get my mind going. And then ultimately that leads to that painting that I did, you know, two years ago. So kind of full circle in terms of that, that career of, of 20 years, you know, starting from little doodles of, of me wanting to be an astronaut to shaping my whole career and becoming a, an artist. And finally, you know, achieving, you know, a level where I could produce these kinds of paintings and, and be part of a, a whole big, you know, uh, ideas about thinking about what colony ship could be and, and how it could look like. And it's always been fascinating. So I'm always asking what's next, you know, and, and I, I've been looking at the last 10 years. And, and as I was continuing my career, I mean, I also was looking at some, some important landmarks and important dates, and it was just also as fascinating. I mean, you know, it's like over 30 shuttle missions happened, Galax launch for galaxy detections happened, two geology labs on Mars, Cassini orbit Saturns, supermassive black hole Sagittarius in the center of the Milky Way was, was discovered and confirmed, you know, dark matter detected, big, big thing, you know, over seven alien planets detected, you know, and even, even more today. So all these things are happening, and so that's, to me, because I'm always reading science fiction and I'm always very illustrating that, these things are happening at the same time and they excite me all the time. They kind of, you know, inspire me to continue because I'm seeing this happening. So the future that I'm envisioning, I'm seeing also being happening slowly, you know, in real life, and that's exciting. I've, I was also very fortunate over the last four years to work in the game industry, and particularly in Dallas with John Carmack, uh, on Rage Project, and John Carmack is also someone who is passionate about space and who's been working on this idea about reusable rocket launch and, and the vertical takeoff, and there's a few few independent companies who've been at it. And interestingly enough, a couple of days ago, they finally succeeded. Not John Carmack, but one of his competitors. Uh, finally, Grasshopper achieved, you know, the the take off the vertical and then you know the flight that they were trying to achieve and that that was big that was big news at least to me that's that was for several years a big race for it and they finally did it and it's incredible to watch it and then two days ago i also find out now you can get a ticket to mars there is apparently a mars one mission that now is recruiting and is already more than thirty thousand people signing up and it's a one-way ticket it's like uh, now it's happening. You can be going to Mars, and you can be one of the first to colonize a planet. I've 
you know, what would happen there, I don't know, but but it's happening. Their program is going to be starting. We're going to select a few people, and there's going to be an eight-year training. And if they're smart enough, you know, they'll, they'll get the right sponsors and make something happen that would kind of, you know, excite people uh, worldwide. And they could be having that as a TV show and try to get everyone excited about it and see what happens. And it could be, you know, wonderful or it could be a big disaster. But it's it's moving forward. It's 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 very exciting to see that happen. So I'm thinking, you know, all these projects here part of that conference, Icarus, Elias, Tintin. And to me, after 20 years of career and seeing what I've seen, and even seen what I've seen the last two days, and I'm looking at this and I say, hell yes. I mean, we, 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 we need to do that. We, we have to do that. It, it's just, it's, it, to me, it's like I don't even question that it's not, it, it, it is going to happen. It's just a matter of time and, and determination. But there's absolutely no reason at the pace that things have been happening uh, that this project will not. I mean, they, they, will, they will happen. You know, they might take a different shape, but you know, I really believe that we'll get there. If we're already signing up people to go to Mars and the people signing up by 30,000 people so far, there's no reason this is not gonna happen. This is happening. And so at the end of the day, I'm looking at myself and says, what well, do I still wanna be an astronaut? Well, I mean, realistically, no, I'm not today, obviously. Uh, my path has been different, but if I look back, really, uh, I've been in space for the last 30 years. In my own mind as an artist, I've been doing that. And so I, I think somehow I've been an astronaut, you know, and I'm kind of very happy about it. So, so there's definitely no complaint there. You know, that dream actually somehow happened in a different way and, and it's very exciting. And so I'd like to close that, that presentation with Buzz Lightyear's famous lines. To me, it's to infinity and beyond, and this is how, where I hope we'll go. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. We have time for one brief question. What are you working on now, and what's next? <laughs> now, I'm working on the uh, Shanghai uh, Walt Disney theme park that's being built, and it's been a project that I've been working on for the last several years now. It's, it's a big, big project. Uh, I've worked on two upcoming movies, uh, one being the sequel for 300, The Rise of an Empire, that's coming, I think, in March, next March. And I've also worked on The Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, that's coming up next year. And I'm most likely gonna be working on the next Marvel project in the next few weeks. So that's uh, what's been happening. And of course, you know, I do covers on a regular basis, always do. I think I'll never stop doing that. So I have a few new book covers coming out. And that's uh, pretty much it for now. And that's pretty much enough on my plate. <laughs> Are you going to do anything on uh, traversable wormholes and warp drives? Any kind of artwork relevant for those spots? Well, you know, it's always about people calling me and commissioning me based on what they'd like to see. And so I, I, I would say most likely, yes. I mean, it's, I don't see why not. Yes, absolutely, yes. No, it's like to me, that's, that's the fun of doing what I do, is being able to participate to things that are sometimes not necessarily a science fiction illustration or something fantasy, but something that's more about how to illustrate art science. Thank you very much for thank our speaker. And uh, we're going to turn to we have more time for questions. we're going to turn to the Farmaker Speed Sketch Awards uh, right now. And uh, Keith Rezebek has spearheaded this effort. Um, it's uh, it's really been a, a pleasure to, to to see all of the submissions, and I'm looking forward yeah, to slides real. Give us a second to just pull up the slides and we will quickly do some something pretty amazing. <clears throat> Actually, I can I think I can say a couple of words first while he's looking that up. So if you want to see the uh, the, the shot of the data list that he mentions, uh, that hit me. It was the January 2011 or oh, geez, 2013 uh, National Geographic issue on Explore, the special issue on ex exploration. Uh, and I saw it, I said, ah, that, that looks familiar in several different ways that collide in a very useful way. And, you know, 
the rest is history, so it's excellent. So uh, Cory Doctorow has said that if you want to change the future, you change the story that people tell themselves about the future. And these days, many stories are visual or interactive, whether through movies, through gaming, through entertainment. Um, so the interstellar arts can help boost interstellar science by helping us to set a trajectory as, as a people and in our imagination so that we can see an optimistic future where humanity achieves its full potential. Um, so we staged our first uh, interstellar art contest for this event. And I actually need to do one thing. Nick, if you could do me a favor and see those uh, three slips on top of there, bring them up to the stage here. I need really, really quick for Richard and Mike to quickly come up to the stage because I want to thank them both. I want to thank Andreas and Richard for uh, giving us the chance to do this. And I want to thank Mike for being one of the reasons I'm here and like a brother to me and give them the patch design for this contest which was designed by Blake Dumesnil, who designed uh, the final uh, space shuttle patch and um, the ISS patch currently in existence. So this is the Farmaker Interstellar Speed Sketch Contest patch design, and thank you all very much thank you, thank you. for having faith in the idea. <clears throat> so um, a speed sketch in uh, concept art is a rendering that is done in a fairly short time for entertainment design to capture the essence of an idea or a vision. And we had an amazing jury for this, largely thanks to Stefan's leadership in helping to build it. Uh, Stefan led the jury, which included Mike Okuda of Star Trek fame, Steve Berg, who designed the Prometheus and is uh, currently at work on other projects in the, you'll hear about in the future, which I don't think I can tell you whether he's working on them or not, but Dr. Harold uh, Sonny White and Kelvin Long advised in a technical capacity and gave that part of the vision to judging. Adrian Mann and Mark Rademacher came at it from their vision. So we had an incredible um, group of judges. And uh, thanks to a generous contribution by Dr. Chuck Pell and an anonymous award, we were able to do cash prizes for these awards. So the winners of these will receive cash prizes that we're going to summarize. I see I've got three minutes. We're going to try to do what we can here. So the children's bracket had 10 submissions. The enthusiast bracket had 16 submissions. And the professional bracket had 26 submissions. And so we're going to run right through the winners. In the children's bracket, the third place is actually a tie from This is the Inside by Emmanuel Bello, age 8. We can just applaud for each frame as we go quickly through. And third, okay. and third place children's bracket gets $20 uh, prize, an honorary one-year seat on the Farmaker team, and publication and credit in the first Farmaker edition, should we do that, as well as a print of the badge. And you can see a print over there on, on these items we're going to auction. That will go to the auction winner as well. Uh, and children's bracket, third place tie, Ship Schematic by Amergen Gourlay, age eight. And there we have that. And same prizes for that third place tie, the $20 as well. So, children's bracket, second place, shuttle-like spaceship with future propulsion system by Jonathan Bello, age nine. And he'll get a $30 prize, an honorary one-year seat on the Farmaker team, publication credit, and the mission badge design. Children's bracket, first place, Beginning of the Journey, by Sophie Helen Zeidler, age six. This was a beloved piece in the, in the rounds. The, the, the color and the motion uh, you know, speaks for itself. So, $50 prize for uh, six-year-old Helen, and uh, honorary one-year seat, a 13 by 19 print of Space, by Stéphane Martinier publication and credit, and uh, the Farmaker badge design. Enthusiast bracket, third place, terraformers. And so these would be um, people of any age that consider themselves enthusiasts rather than professional artists. Uh, terraformers by Charles Sutton. And third place enthusiast bracket has $25 prize, uh, honorary seat, publication, and a print of the badge. Enthusiast bracket, second place, Untitled by Tarian Witt. 
This got a lot of notes for the many different things going on. Clearly, space is a place where lots of things are going on. Plenty's there to explore. Second place gets $50 prize, honorary seat, publication credit, and the mission badge design. An enthusiast bracket, first place, Daedalus Rendezvous by Casey Gurr. And this, uh, Casey gets a $100 prize, honorary seat, an original sketch by Stefan, as well as publication and credit and, a, and the badge design. Professional bracket, third place. Okay, yeah, so this is very, I, this was all very interesting to me. We actually have another tie in the, in the professional bracket for second place. Third place is Destination Reached by Nathan Bad Battlecher. A very original vision of the Daedalus, seemingly a transformable craft. He chose to focus on uh, grayscale for the time because ske speed sketches all had to be done within 1.5 hours. And so, third place professional bracket, $75 prize, honorary seat, and publication and credit in the badge design. Professional bracket, second place, tie. This was, this, to me, this was a black swan, a surprise, but I'm really delighted. We had a free form category, Life Star by Cyril Vanderhagen. I am not kidding. Beautiful, huh? <laughs> Habitats moving off of the main ship. So, And uh, $150 prize, an honorary seat, publication and credit, print of the Farmaker Mission Badge Design. And tied for second place, Arrival Breaking by Thomas Peters. And likewise, $150 prize, an honorary seat on the team, and publication and credit, as well as the badge design. And first place professional prize for the first Farmaker Speed Sketch Contest is Breathless Sight by Steven Zavala. And that may be familiar. Because that is one of the two pieces we're going to gather in auction in a moment. $200 prize, an honorary seat, a limited edition copy of Stefan's art book, Velocity, including an original signed drawing. And so, thank you very much for supporting this. And what I want to say is, this really blossomed once we had the generous donations that made the cash prize possible. Because these people are aspiring to bring something into a reality, which, which as we know does sometimes take funding. So what we would like to do, and what Stefan has offered to do, is we are auctioning right here and now the, a canvas print of his work, which he will sign after this, as well as the first place winner and the badge design and all proceeds from this auction we're about to do, we'll go to fund the next Fire and Maker Speed Sketch Contest and get us off on the right foot. So here's Andreas to lead the way. So uh, this is the first time I've ever auctioned something. <laughs> they're, both, they're both prints on canvas. They're both prints on canvas. Um, can we open the auction somewhere at $20? Yeah. Do I hear $40? Yeah. Which one? Which one? This is the whole set. So we're, so we're auctioning the two pieces together. Whoever gets the, the Martiniere print will also get the first farm maker, the first farm maker print. So I want to, I want to remind everyone that, that we've put everything that we've, uh, I'll stop talking and start. <laughs> 100. 100. Thank you very much, Buck. 150. Mike Mongo. 200. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Do I hear 270? Thank you. Thank you very much. Do I hear 290 by any chance? I want to remind everyone that we put $350 into the Farm Maker Award initially. Nice. 290. Do I hear 350? Haha, <laughs> Pat Galea knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Can someone beat Pat Galea in his own game? Nice. 375. Can we keep this going? 390, perhaps. Three, 400. Pat Galea will not let anyone have it. <laughs> Four hundred. Four hundred and fifteen. Four hundred and fifteen. Going once. 
415. Thank you so much. We keep on rolling. 400 and... <laughs> 440. Let's, uh, let's see what happens. 440. So, so Andreas, are these, are these signed? So these are signed. These, signed. Stefans will be signed, yes. Stefans will be signed. This is the first Farmaker Speed Sketch Award. 440. Did we have 440? Or were we at 415? Uh, Was that Pat? Oh. Going once? Going twice? Oh. I'm sorry, 450. 415. Thank you very much. 415, thank you. The Stefan Martin sold, sold. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna roll them and tube them, and they'll be nice, beautiful, and safe. Thank you very much. So, as a, as a closing comment, I wanted to say that the energy that this Farmaker Speed Sketch Award, and generally the the decision to make a really big push to include the arts in uh, in this conference has been has been thoroughly rewarding, and uh, the pub public participation has been remarkable, with uh, with matching donations to to add to the Farmaker to add to the Farm Maker Award. Um, we, uh, we are going to continue with the technical conference now. Uh, I would like to, to call Andreas Hein, who is the project leader for Hyperion, who is going to speak to us about ena enabling and disrupting technologies for manned interstellar travel. Thank you very much. Uh, my presentation will be definitely less visual than the one before, but <laughs> I hope you still enjoy it. So um, my talk today will deal with um, manned interstellar flight in and in particular how different technologies actually enable manned interstellar flight and how some technologies might actually disrupt technologies which have been developed previously in order to enable interstellar flight. So it's more about um, the relationship between manned interstellar flight technologies and technologies among each other. Okay, um, a few words about Project Hyperion. Uh, Project Hyperion was uh, founded in December 2011 and its main objective is to come up with a feasible design of a manned interstellar spacecraft using today's technologies or technologies of uh, the near future. So um, let me give you a brief overview over the manned interstellar flight challenge because I think it's really important to uh, map out the fundamentals of this problem. So manned interstellar flight basically consists of three separate tasks. So the first task is uh, the transportation task and this has been extensively addressed within the literature. So you transport humans in what form soever to a target star system. However, once, arriving, once arrived at this target star system, you somehow have to colonize this target star system because this is the ultimate goal of manned interstellar flight unless you do a round trip. So you construct a colony within the target star system. However, you don't want to construct a colony for maybe 50 years or 100 years. You would like to establish a permanent presence within the target star system. So ultimately, the goal is to establish a long-term and sustainable civilization within the target star system. And these are basically three distinct problems, all part of a manned interstellar flight. Okay, so first, um, what concepts or what options do exist for transporting humans to another star system? And here we have basically four distinct concepts. So the most well-known concept is the world ship, colony ship concept, also known as generation ship concept. And this basically consists of a huge habitat containing hundreds or thousands of people 
maybe taking hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years to arrive at the target star system. So these are massive ships. The next concept is hibernation. So you basically put humans into a sleeping state and you wake them up at the target star system. And by doing that, you hope to reduce um, mass with respect in terms of um, life support system mass and habitat mass. The next concept, which is more advanced, is uh, the embryo colonization concept. And this basically summarizes all concepts which deal with sending basically the DNA or uh, basic forms of human life uh, to the stars and somehow raise children or resurrect humans at the target destination. So quite an advanced concept. Um, one of the most advanced concepts are uh, digital starships which uh, are based on uh, brain emulation, mind uploading. So you basically upload your mind into a computer and you send this computer to the stars. And by using some unknown technology, you would resurrect humans at the target destination. So either by cloning, either by, I don't know, 3D printing organisms. Uh, this is quite unclear uh, currently. Okay. As you see, um, the resource savings you get from these concepts increases in this direction, and the technological maturity um, is actually decreasing in this direction. So this concept, the world colony ship concept, is um, probably feasible with um, technologies of the near future. However, concepts like the digital starship are um, even not um, Sure, it's even not sure whether they ever get feasible or not. Okay, so next, um, the colonization problem itself, so to construct colonies. Again, we have different options. So the most attractive one is, of course, if you find a habitable planet, which is basically an Earth analog. So you simply have to land on the surface and humans would be able to live uh, on that planet. So this would be an ideal case. Unfortunately, the probability that we will find such a planet is quite low within the vicinity of our solar system. The next option would be uh, an easily terraformable planet. Um, so you have a planet maybe like Mars, maybe more um, interesting or e more easily to terraform as Mars, and you would establish a kind of artificial biosphere by doing uh, terraforming. Um, finally, if you find a planet which is not terraformable, you still have an option to establish a permanent planetary colony on its surface. Of course, this is uh, quite sophisticated because you have to su sustain such a colony for extended time frames, maybe probably thousands of years, uh, which is quite challenging. And if you don't find any planet at all, you might still be able to harvest minor bodies within the target system or uh, small moons and construct space colonies out of them. Okay, so if you map the different tasks for manned interstellar flight here on uh, uh, this axis, and then if you map the different options on this axis, you actually get a matrix of different options here. I explicitly left out um, options for establishing a civilization because we don't really know how to do it. Uh, maybe we can extrapolate or maybe we have to make sure that enough resources are available within the target star system. But they're not explicit technical options to deal with that problem as far as I know. So given these options, of course, um, if we think about how to develop these technologies or how to think about these technologies, we have to answer two questions. So the first question is, which technologies do play a role in a broad range of uh, scenarios? So this is quite important because if you develop a scenario and it turns out that we uh, discover a habitable planet maybe in the next five to 10 years, uh, then we might this discovery might render the development uh, with, um, for this particular technology obsolescent. So the next question is, which technologies might render previous technologies obsolescent? So this is more uh, dealing with the relationship between technologies. So what if we have a more advanced technology which renders a previous um, heritage technology obsolescent? 
uh, how do I approach this problem? So first of all, we have to know what technologies actually exist and what, which technologies do enable manned interstellar flight. And I came up with this uh, list of different technologies. Um, some of them are, um, I think, familiar to most of you. So closed loop environmental control and life support systems, habitat technologies, or technologies which deal with um, um, a manned habitat, then high performance radiators, et cetera, et cetera. So these technologies are limited to um, the ones which enable and sustain human human life. So I haven't, I have excluded all technologies which deal with uh, classic spacecraft subsystems like the power subsystem, uh, propulsion system, etc. So this is a kind of limited set of technologies. So after enum enumerate, having enumerated um, these technologies, I mapped the technologies to the different solution options I presented before uh, in the matrix. And what I did next is to assess whether or not this particular technology was used in a particular solution option. And when you do, do that, uh, you can do um, something very easy. Uh, you can simply sum up um, how many times this particular technology has, has been used across the different solution options. And you simply normalize this value, and then you come up with a ranking uh, for uh, various technologies. And in the next step, I analyzed various scenarios. So these scenarios include, OK, whether or not we have uh, we discover a habitable planet, whether or not we discover planets at all uh, within um, close by star systems, etc. And comparing how robust these technologies are across different scenarios. So first of all, I considered um, all the options. So this is the starting point for uh, today. So we don't know whether there are habitable planets within the vicinity of our sun uh, to, the, to the point that uh, whether or not we know whether humans can land on its surface and then live, live on the surface. We don't know whether there are terraformable planets, etc. cetera. And um, the result is here. Um, we see here that Automated manufacturing is a technology which is used in, or which has uh, the highest rank among these technologies. Auto automated manufacturing means that you manufacture complex systems in space autonomously. The next technology is radiation protection, which you obviously need if you have humans uh, living uh, in space. And then knowledge management, artificial intelligence. So this is artificial intelligence which is required for storing and sustaining knowledge over extended time frames. Uh, so next, what happens if an Earth analog is discovered? And what you see here is the green arrows indicate whether or not the rank of, the, of a technology changed. Um, so the red arrow indicates whether um, a technology has a lower rank than in, within the initial scenario. And what you see is that here we have three technologies which are, have increased in rank. First, radiation protection, then high performance radiators, and impact shielding. And we have other technologies like ecosystem engineering, which is no longer required or only um, um, or less required than in the scenario in which I have to deal with terraforming and building uh, space colonies within the target star system. So next. Um, what if we don't discover habitable planets? And if, what if we don't discover terraformable planets? So what happens is, with respect to the initial scenario, uh, radiation protection raises in, in rank. Um, knowledge management, artificial intelligence decreases in rank. And ecosystem engineering decreases in rank as well. We can repeat that, that exercise for this scenario in which we don't even discover a planet which is uh, feasible for constructing surface colonies. And the result here is that we again have a decrease in rank for artificial intelligence, knowledge management, and ecosystem engineering. So comparing these different scenarios, we end up <coughs> with this uh, matrix. What you can see here is that automated manufacturing stays uh, at the top rank across all different scenarios. Next, we have radiation protection also stays basically at the top, and high performance radiators also stays 
at the top. Knowledge management decreases in rank somehow, and also ecosystem engineering also decreases in rank. But the interesting thing here is that you see that most of the technologies stay quite stable in rank. Uh, and this is quite interesting to see because um, if we invest in these, for instance, top three technologies, we can be quite sure that um, they or the investment will pay off no matter what the scenario in the future uh, will be. So, of course, it's not enough to um, assess technologies with respect to whether they are robust across a whole range of scenarios. We, of course, have to assess whether or not these technologies have um, an impact on manned interstellar flight itself. And with impact, I mean, uh, do they actually reduce the mass which is required to tra transport humans or to colonize a target star system? And these specific technologies are here hibernating technologies which might have the potential to reduce the mass which is required for a spacecraft by an order of 10. Then um, embryo colonization and digital colonization might have the potential to reduce um, the mass by an order of uh, 100. So these are really rough order of magnitude estimates. But these technology actually got ranked quite uh, lowly in across the scenarios before, and therefore we have to treat them separately with respect to their impact uh, they have on a manned interstellar flight mission. So um, before I uh, get to the results of the analysis, first a few words about uh, disruptive technologies, because um, disruptive technologies are technologies which have the potential to render previous technologies obsolescent. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with the technology S-curve, so um, you initially develop a technology here at that stage, then you um, invest a lot in order to get a technology to the level where it's mature enough to be applied um, within a certain market or application, and then the technology stagnates, stagnates at a certain point with respect to a certain performance metric. And what usually happens is with radical technology is that you extend this technology S-curve, which is basically only an overlap of two technology S-curves. And in the case of, for example, microcomputing uh, or processor capacit uh, capacity, you have a succession of these technology S-curves, which results in uh, basically Morse uh, law. What happens with disruptive technology is that you develop a technology in a different market and mature the technology in this different market, and then this technology disrupts a different market. So in the context of interstellar flight, that might mean, <coughs> that means that you develop a technology maybe for a terrestrial application, you mature that technology, and this technology ultimately disrupts um, the domain of manned interstellar flight. Okay, so the concept of disruptive technology is so important because it might render previous investments into a certain technology obsolescent, and therefore um, I did the following. So I mapped all the technologies, previous technologies on that axis, identified the potentially disruptive technologies here, and then I mapped all the technologies again on uh, this axis, and then I analyzed whether or not these technologies these technologies on that axis might disrupt technologies on that axis and indicated this by an X here in the matrix. What I found out is that the technology with the most impact or disruptive power is actually brain emulation or mind uploading because it disrupts or makes a whole range of technologies obsolescent. So um, what happens with uh, the ranking, uh, technology ranking, if I take disruption into uh, consideration? The interesting thing which happens is that um, the ranking of, uh, or the rank of brain emulation and mind uploading is, is significantly changing if that technology is mature enough. So you can see that um, brain emulation is actually um, getting one of the priority or first ranked technologies um, in this uh, technology portfolio. Okay, um, so what about the prospects of brain emulation and mind uploading? Because currently it's not sure whether or not this technology will get uh, feasible, uh, ever get feasible. Um, 
So there are several projects underway currently. So one uh, or one project is, is the Human Brain Project, which, which was approved by uh, the European Union just a few uh, months ago, and which is funded by uh, one billion uh, dollars over the next uh, 10 years. And this project has the objective to simulate the human brain. Of course, simulating the human brain is not equivalent to uh, upload your mind. However, it's one of the precursor technologies you need to ultimately upload uh, a brain. And if you ask experts, then they estimate that uh, the time until we will get to the point uh, when brain emulation is feasible is estimated between a few decades or a few centuries. So of course, most of you would think that an estimate which ranges from a several decades to a several century does not make any sense. However, um, my end and the stellar flight will probably get feasible from a resource perspective, maybe uh, during the next um, several hundreds of years. And therefore, uh, we have to think about what happens with brain emulation with respect to manned interstellar flight at that point uh, already. Okay. Um, so, coming back to the point of technology strategy, so we will rank these technologies in order to identify the technologies we should invest in. Um, we have two different categories of technologies. So, the first category of technologies are um, low risk to, the, um, to invest in. With low risk, I mean there's a high probability that these technologies will be used in a future manned interstellar flight mission. And here we have technologies which are high risk, high gain, and which might disrupt some of the other technologies. And if you think about establishing or um, building up the technology portfolio, you have to somehow balance these technologies with each other. So it might not be a very good decision to only invest into high risk, high gain technologies, but you also want to make sure that you have technologies here which are robust across these different uh, scenarios, future scenarios. Okay, so what are the conclusions? Um, there are technologies that are very likely to be used in almost any future manned interstellar flight mission. Um, there are um, disruptive technologies uh, that are high risk, uh, high gain, but one should probably look into. And um, the strategy one should pursue is to find the right mix between these two different uh, sets of technologies. And future work of course, we um, have to update uh, the list of technologies to refine the analysis, and maybe the results of this um, presentation and also the method itself might be a valuable tool for other uh, interstellar groups as well in order to come up with um, a sustainable technology strategy. So thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Thank you. Uh, we also did some uh, uh, reference project about uh, 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 interstellar um, starships, and we have uh, many common uh, technologies here. Uh, two of them, which uh, maybe uh, you, you should uh, consider, because we feel that they are really crucial. One of them is uh, a healthcare system that can allow uh, real-time intervention on any type of uh, disease which may really be critical in a, in a closed uh, ecosystem like a starship. And another one is uh, faster than light communications, because I believe that faster than light communication can really change completely uh, the rules of the game. I'm not talking about the speed of the starship, but at least for communications. Okay, let's thank our speaker. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Dr. Aaron Carden, who is also a member of Project Hyperion, and he will speak to us about ideal biological characteristics for long-term manned space travel.
And, and while we're getting ready here, I just wanted to, to note that I know it's Sunday and some of us are, are, uh, are fighting uh, some crankiness here. So we're, we're going to, uh, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna make some of the, the, the session chair panel summary is, is gonna be a little bit shorter and uh, we're gonna try to get people out uh, like a little bit before two o'clock. And uh, also a quick reminder that, that we don't have a lunch arrangement today. So if you, uh, uh, if that crankiness is gonna turn to some violent acts, then <laughs> perhaps we should, you can go in and pick up something something from the corridors during, uh, from, from the snack bars, from the, uh, uh, during the breaks. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hine. Um, so I guess to avoid uh, any of that violence, um, the first thing to identify is that we all need food. So we'll just take that on the, on the uh, trip. Um, so as I said, my name is Aaron Carden. My day job is clinical residency in child and developmental neurology. Um, I've been fortunate enough to spend my free time thinking about Hyperion. Uh, Dr. Obusi asked me about a year ago what now sounds to be a very similar question to Dr. Bishop's from yesterday. What are the ideal physique, intellectual capabilities, and emotional characteristics of a long duration space traveler? So in thinking about that for the year, the more I think about it, the more that question transforms into a set of interrelated questions, all looking from different angles at the expected adaptations of human biology to the ultimate goal of a manned interstellar mission. Richard is also my source of inspiration for a recurring private joke in my daily life. He once commented that the most frustrating part of asking a medical doctor any question is the inevitable answer that it depends. <laughs> Nearly daily in my professional life, I actually chuckle to myself when I hear us say it over and over. So today, I can answer Richard's question that it depends. It depends primarily on mission design and how the constraints of that given mission alter the ecological niche we place the travelers into. Through my involvement with Hyperion, as Andreas was just telling us, um, I learned of these radically different mission designs. They do all share a common element, which is space, and we are not ideally suited for space travel. We are very fragile creatures. My favorite organ, the brain, the seat of our creativity and cognitive sophistication, is supported very precariously by nearly half of our daily energy output. Hypoxia to only 85% of normal begins to compromise our mental function, and before reaching 70% of normal, we really approach unconsciousness. Similar com compromises to exquisitely balanced water and food intake lead rather rapidly to decline in our cognitive capacity and physical function, ultimately to death. This is before we begin to consider changes in gravitation, external pressure, and other factors. Homo sapien and his physiology, cognition, and emotions was shaped by evolution to match his terrestrial environment. Thus far, in sending our best and brightest into the near reaches of Earth orbit and the moon, we've recognized these limitations and adapted by bringing the environment directly with us. These missions, of course, have been high intensity, brief duration forays off of our world. In contrast, interstellar missions will be characterized by long duration, a fixed or planned energy supply for the interstellar void, and a one-way voyage. Hyperion has chosen to focus this analysis on the world ship, often envisioned as a hollowed out asteroid with a sufficiently large diameter to comfortably house a multi-generational population numbering in the thousands. So now we're getting somewhere. As others have noted, such a ship is incredibly resource intensive, but best provides for the needs of astronauts by foreseeable technologies. Earth is, of course, that first multi-generational spaceship that man populated and has passively flown since we awoke consciously upon it. But the next world ship will have some significant differences. Earth has remained static in its gravity and atmospheric pressure throughout our evolution. Even if extremely large, we can imagine that Hyperion would still be a fraction of the mass of even our moon. Even between the gravity of the ship and the centrifugal force we may achieve by rotational methods, it may not be energy efficient in the long term to reach a steady 1G. Modern astronauts show effects of this lack of gravity on their basic fluid balance, best evidenced by an increased rate of pressure-related headaches. Perhaps we will counteract these problems at a significantly reduced artificial gravity. Similarly, for its enclosed atmosphere, one atmospheric pressure requires minimal crew adaptation, but perhaps we will find we do not need that ship to meet us all the way there. Interestingly, the natural circadian rhythm of Homo sapien is likely at a minimum five to 10% longer than the solar day. Melatonin, the hormone that tells us when to sleep and when to wake, 
is released in different times based on, um, based on conditions of light deprivation. Subjects gradually extend their natural day to a 26 to 28 hour cycle. This is just one example of many biological processes that are regulated by daily exposure to natural sunlight. So at a minimum, we have to consider if the starship day is really ideally the same 24 hours that we experience here. Carrying forward from our early uh, ancestors, we do remain energy prudent. We use and store nearly every calorie, hoarding for future famine. Though a starship will certainly have an ecosystem with a fixed limit on energy, the civilization capable of building one will also certainly calculate closely how that energy would be recycled through the ecosystem to support its inhabitants. Though that environment may not remain as static as the Earth in which we evolved, variability could be accommodated by a modifiable physiology, as I'll explore in a little bit. Gradual evolution over several short 15 to 25 year generations was ideal on Earth to fit our static environment. While the fountain of youth has always been one of our oldest quests, our, our longest average lifespan now around 78 years provides ample time to accumulate wisdom, affect change on the world, and impart our legacy to the following generations. The duration of the interstellar flight, however, will make longevity truly important in its current desirability on Earth. At one-tenth the speed of light, everyone knows a journey to our nearest neighbor is still over 400 years, and there's no reason to think that this system is the first desirable target. Even to recruit those interstellar voyagers, we must offer, offer them either a lifespan so extended as to approach eternal to our modern mind, a community desirably improved from their other options, or some hybrid of both. If only because our models of physiology are most refined, we have no more empirical data, or we have more empirical data and testable hypotheses for the effects on physiology aboard Hyperion. However, we don't lack evidence and maturing theories to understand our cognition and how it might be improved to emission design. Avoiding predators and chasing prey on the plane, heuristic cognitive models reign supreme. Rough and ready rules that err on the side of safety and self-preservation, cognitive heuristics are practical rules that shape and reinforce neural networks, some so primitively that we are born with them. We see that face in the clouds because our social nature is so hardwired into us that we show that facial recognition before two months of age. And as we grow, our networks that fire together wire together, such that heuristics in the neural network are constantly at play, and our attention and other processes are self-reinforcing over the years. In contrast, when we force ourselves to approach our problems methodically and rigorously, we may take more time, but we may find our answers more complete. The new challenges that may be presented to a world ship crew that may not have faster than light communication are more likely to require these highly sophisticated answers, where intuitive heuristics may become more and more risky. Similarly, our cognition is staged. We're born into a world of wonder, where new discovery awaits every day through our early development and into adolescence. A limitless division of labor and supply of energy available on the ever-increasing population on Earth allowed us to support non-productive members. <clears throat> Small colonies, on the other hand, never have that luxury, but retain the challenges of navigating and controlling their entire world, a technological sophistication we are far from achieving. Thus, if wisdom could be explanted into an external memory by a technological enhancement, the highly adapted neural networks could further focus their energy on persistent curiosity. Finally, the emotional characteristics of the crew, sorry. These emotional characteristics are the linchpin of their social cohesion and success in tackling obstacles in their relative isolation in space. Migration and expansion on Earth are driven by a dissonance between the open frontier and a tribal cohesion. Although our individual survival is best achieved by group cooperation, Disagreement within the group may lead to fragmentation with resulting expansion into the open frontier. <clears throat> On the other hand, across those multiple generations, the world ship remains the closed system, where persistent community harmony becomes increasingly important to mi mission success. Ironically, in contrast to the starship being the vessel to the next frontier, all of those leaving on and later born onto the ship will have no frontier into which to move, should disagreement arise. Add to this the strain of the necessity of maintaining a relatively static population size, and we can all see that a very different social environment on the starship is apparent. So if I've convinced you that Hyperion, the hollowed out asteroid with a closed ecosystem and a stable crew sized in the thousands to tens of thousands, comes far from meeting our current biological characteristics, 
then how might we fill these gaps? Evolution would inch ever closer to filling them, but its exact pressures would not be in place until the ship is created and the crew was placed into that niche. The successful interstellar civilization, however, seems unlikely to wait the 2,500 years or 100 generations that evolution may minimally require. Rather, early mission success would likely rely on taking matters into our own hands and t with technological innovation. So I want to spend the next few minutes considering these maturing technologies that may be applied to developing these characteristics. The TRL, developed by the ESA, helps us rank various emerging technologies and identify how to move them forward to the maturity needed for mission readiness. Ranging from the level of TRL-1, when a new discovery of basic principle is found, which may offer technology for a needed application, to the full flight readiness and post-operation improvement at TRL-9, the scale tries to create a level ground across which to evaluate these emerging technologies for application. I mentioned longevity early when thinking about physiologic adjustments. Just as we increase the longevity of our machines by identifying and replacing the broken parts, it has been proposed that by growing an organ derived from oneself and using it for transplant, the complications and life-shortening consequences of immune rejection could be avoided. As you can see by this picture from Ott's group, a beating heart and lungs have been grown in the laboratory. After creating a protein matrix scaffold, for example, by 3D printing, not how this one was created, but that would be one choice, the cells can then be carefully stimulated to replace and differentiate into a full organ system. So this technology has been shown to be modeled in a realistic simulated environment, integrated with reasonably realistic supporting elements. It would seem to be TRL5, if you look closely, you can see that these organs belong to a rodent. From pioneering work in Europe, we, there are multiple patients today to have received autologous transplants. <clears throat> these patients are all only tracheal patients. This is a trachea that was then implanted back into the patient. So with full technologies in the lab requiring further testing and validation in clinical practice, complex organ transplantation is more immature, perhaps in the range of a TRL4. <clears throat> but if we consider the limits of autologous transplants, particular organs come to mind, again, most notably the brain, which are resistant to mere replacement upon dysfunction. These may require more sophisticated manipulation to achieve meaningful increases in longevity. Above tissue transplants, the most common technology, the one we discussed yesterday, that always comes to mind is genetic engineering. You want longevity? Just stabilize telomeres. If you want to maintain strength and microgravity, increase muscle mass or bone density. However, all biochemistry students will recall, perhaps with a shudder, that comprehensive metabolic schematic such as the one here from Roche. <clears throat> it reminds us not only of the complexity and breadth of the cell machinery, but also of its intricate interrelatedness. Permanently up or down regulating genes to modify metabolic pathways, even if confined to single organs, may reap disastrous consequences. While genetic engineering has truly matured over the last several decades to a practical technology being used across many systems in agriculture, research models, biofuels, and so on, we are still awaiting maturity in its clinical application to humans. Other, another promising technology that I should mention, though, is now also mature in mouse models. It's modifiable genetic expression. This schematic shows that by linking a gene of interest to a modifiable uh, expression vector, we can turn on and off that gene by giving the drug of interest. In this case, doxycycline is the, is the drug used in the lab today. One could envision a modifiable genome by which a drug cocktail or various cocktails can be taken at opportune times, thus allowing for some permanent changes and other transient enhancements whose effects would then subside and no longer interfere with the otherwise normal function. The nootropics are a broad term to include any pharmaceutical which enhances brain function. Cognitive enhancement through pharmacology, however, has a sordid history, to say the least. <laughs> Cocaine and amphetamine each gained popularity in Western medicine for their remarkable effects on concentration, attention, and stamina, and they only later fell out of favor as addiction emerged prominent. The nootropic's major challenge may actually come less from variability or questionable success and more from the unpredictable or negative balance of intended effects versus adverse effects. 
The replacements do become safer with each generation as our pharmacology matures, but at the same time, our cognitive science is finding that intelligence is a finely tuned combination of attention, creativity, memory, and other high-level constructs carried constantly through our oscillating networks. <clears throat> Thus, while a cursory look at the current market may lead you to believe that these nootropics have a mature technology and you should pick them up with their TRL level of eight, we may actually only be closer to understanding the key characteristics of brain chemistry modification and its effects on cognitive parameters with a TRL much closer to three to four. A mature cognitive theory may even conclude that neuropharmaceuticals are best applied as targeted reversible drugs with acceptable trade-offs, an attentional enhancer for detailed tasks which reduces creativity, or a separate creative enhancer for problem solving but without attention to detail, or so on. There may not be a one-size-fits-all take-a-pill daily that will boost our, us past our finely tuned success in spite of the, the heuristic handicaps I mentioned earlier. Finally, another exciting medical technology getting increasing press is the so-called brain-computer interface. Achieving high enough fidelity to directly communicate with the brain, it turned out, required invasive implantation and decoding of neural spike codes. We'll never get there with all these wires just sitting on our scalp. <clears throat> Medically, brain-computer interfaces are moving close to restoring mobility, sight, and other impaired neurologic functions to those patients suffering from their loss. It may still seem science fiction, but actually among us today walks the first cyborg. Use of an interface purely for enhancement was demonstrated at MIT by a peripheral implant to achieve direct neural control across the internet to Cambridge of a remote robotic arm. However, BCI neural enhancement has not yet, and I don't know if we can accurately predict if or when it will take the form of direct cognitive enhancement. Instead, increased facilitation of communication between complementary systems of our brain and, and external machines would be more likely. We don't yet completely understand our own cognitive processes and still understand much better the computers that we've created. So until we mature our theory of consciousness sufficiently to intentionally reproduce it, it will be difficult to persuade me of the benefits of asking the machine to think with us. Don't misunderstand me. I am intensely interested in these technologies, so much so that I'd likely be an early volunteer for a cosmetic memory interface. But don't expect me to see, to see me sign up anytime soon. <clears throat> If cognitive enhancement has a sordid history, social engineering may be the devil's playbook. But is social engineering the great unknown in a Starship mission design? It seems unlikely to me because we know the constraints of the mission design. Let's remember that Hyperion would be an ongoing community of thousands, very different in crew dynamics from a small crew whose success was best achieved by the totalitarian captain. Small communities are prone to the influence of charismatic personalities, and runaway popularity or unequal power distribution could threaten to tear such a community apart. Again, harmony is paramount, but not at the expense of innovation and progress in the face of adversity. Thus, the social structure of the community guided by the emotional needs of its individuals must strive for their fulfillment. Put another way, humans mostly need intense social interaction to succeed. We don't want to work in isolation, and we thrive on shared ideas and purpose. Although sometimes the reflex reaction in considering emotions with respect to effectiveness is to discount and ignore them, the ways a community treats one another is truly their glue. I'm no psychologist, economist, or sociologist, and I really defer this section of my talk to Dr. Bishop's mo more excellent treatment yesterday of it. I don't pretend to know whose gun better turns the wheels of productivity. When I look at the diversity of world cultures, even when only considering those most technologically advanced economies, I'm amazed and flummoxed by progress despite dissimilarity and the repeated and spectacular features that, failures that often follow intentional meddling in social forces. So I'm certainly in no position to even begin to assess technology readiness level of social intervention or technologies. So, Briefly, I thought I must throw in a slide about ethics. Jumping to use these technologies to intervene on human achievement may seem overly ambitious without proper restraint, and I was immediately reminded of the phrase misattributed to Hippocrates, which tries to orient us to primary principles. However, it's important to keep in mind the advancing use in humans of most of these technologies is occurring in the context of medical treatment with very clear and ethical goals. <clears throat> most advances 
will occur in the context of solving specific challenges with further applications growing out of their success. Evolution, however, is not a static process, and as we expand across our solar system, I expect that it will continue. If anything, mature genetic engineering accelerates evolution, making it an active process controlled by our needs, instead of the passive reaction to our changing ecological niche. Although I wistfully envision Hyperion as though I am aboard it, the more I do envision its environment and inhabitants, the clearer I understand that I would never be the ideal Hyperion candidate. A chasm separates the limits of my own body's tolerance and the alterations I imagine to adjust to the modified asteroid. Man's cognition is highly adaptable, his curiosity and creativity boundless. His ambition to control his environment, understand and explore his universe, all to the end of exploring its depths with such increasing grandeur as could achieve a manned interstellar mission, I do not doubt. If man escapes the confines of this planet with stable, self-sufficient colonies across this solar system before the next inevitable planetary extinction, I believe man will eventually embark upon an interstellar mission or migration. If, however, the technologies to design such a mission are constrained by the physical and physiologic laws as we currently understand them, the necessary changes we will engender through medical intervention, genetic man manipulation, and cybernetic enhancement will most certainly make us something post-homo sapien, perhaps the homo galactus I heard of yesterday. Thank you. Questions, please? Over here, Heath. I read that uh, the humans are not wired to be uh, as logical as the fictional Vulcans because if humans don't have emotion, they're not capable of making decisions. Yes, that's a very popular uh, um, concept now that seems to be supported by a wealth of evidence. Um, wiring with our amygdala and our hippocampus being so closely linked to that seems to guide our decisions very, very clearly. And it is difficult for us to imagine divorcing our emotion from logic. Uh, I've, I've thought since about the mid-90s that if artificial intelligence is emergent, that it might likely come at the interface level, mm -hmm. because that is where uh, human consciousness is probing data. Mm -hmm. And um, as, as expert systems grow, as systems that use uh, agent AI to bring information into, you know, into our, our diet and accelerate that, um, have you looked at all at... at more sort of interface-driven AI as a place where, where um, that kind of advantage might come? Yeah, so the, the um, example that I'm most interested in is the hippocampal implant or replacement. Um, so many of you may know or have heard of the hippocampus as the primary seat of memory. We know that it governs memory and we know it's critical for memory. And so probing an external interface would certainly involve the hippocampus. But what we don't know is we actually don't, the, the more mature theory is that the information is consolidated through the hippocampus back into the sensory networks from which it came, and it's stored in those sensory networks. So we don't even yet have that mature theory. So when I'm saying that we need a more mature cognitive theory, it's that kind of thing. Or actually, the lab uh, um, that's very close to, to creating a hippocampal uh, chip um, is very good at reproducing the transformations of information coming in and out from the hippocampus. So there is a possibility of restoring lost memory, I would say, in the relatively new future. It's hard to say how long it's going to take to get from where they're at to, to even clinical application. But then using that or modifying that to then allow us to interact with an, an external hard drive, so to speak, it, it just requires more theory before we can even talk about more practice. So I'd just like to uh, pose a thought experiment to you. Mm -hmm. it, of course, we would try our best to have a, a, a world ship or a, a, a long, stable community that is much like us as possible. But imagine that halfway there, there was some accident. You had a significant loss of pressure. You had a collapse of your, uh, of your ecosystem down to much simpler uh, life. I would say that uh, your radiation shielding was not enough. And you had to make a fundamental decision of, do we self-adapt to a, an environment where there is less of everything that we imagine, less gravity, less atmosphere, mm -hmm. less food diversity? How do you, how do you envision uh, 
we would have to adapt in that specific situation where whatever we started designing of this ideal internal volume is now, say, half of everything that we started with. So um, there are two ways that come to my mind. One is uh, to, similarly to uh, how Jerry was saying yesterday that the, the energy and the warp drive that he was, or the energy drive that he was talking about for thrust may be a emergency drive. Um, you could talk about these modifiable gene, modifiable gene expressions to work with anticipated problems like that, anticipated failures, that maybe you have a hibernation set of genes. So if that happens, then you have to hibernate while you wait for a long-term fix that you put in place to then, to then occur. Um, but that again assumes that you can anticipate the problem. If you can't anticipate the problem, if it's something that catches you by surprise, then I worry that the only way to really take care of that is to either have communication back to the home world where they can, where there's more research facilities and resources available to try to come up with the optimal solution, or to have a very advanced um, medical technology and medical research program aboard your ship, which in a small colony of 10,000 may or may not be the most sustainable. I don't know if that gets directly to the thought experiment or not, but. Um, uh, I would like to allow one last uh, question. Last brief question. Now, between now and the first uh, ships that go out, uh, do you envision uh, creating small colony sets within the solar system to play out various scenarios? Yes. Yeah, so that's that's how I that's how I naturally and you know this may be my own bias, but that's how I naturally envision that you would get to a civilization that is capable of of launching that starship is a Kardashev, is that a Kardashev II civilization, I believe, that, uh, that is across its own galaxy. So you're looking at multiple inhabitants across multiple um, physical, uh, um, physical situations. So co the colonies that are the ones that are most suitable to send out are not the colonies from Earth, but the colonies rather from the asteroids. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to a brief break now. And uh, we're looking for Rob Swinney, if he can come to the front, please.
this is me, um, a background in astronomy and engineering and a, a long career in the Air Force, which I now retired about five or six years ago. And believe it or not, I basically do th pretty much this full time nowadays. So, But that was the 1980s. So I consider myself less of an engineer, perhaps, or a scientist, or whatever you like to call it, more of an engineering manager for quite a few years. I'd just like to go through some things on Project Icarus today, and that's the scope I'm going to cover. I've got about 30 minutes, not as on the program, so I'll be trying to go through a little bit quicker through some of the, the slides. But I always like to start my presentation by this uh, diagram, which represents a modern rendition of a British Interplanetary Society project from 1938, uh, where they designed a lunar lander, which was to uh, be launched on a multi-stage rocket, this is 1938, and have a lunar lander that looks something like that. Now, if, you, if, you, if you think 30 years on from 1938, you'd have to agree they were pretty close. And that, from the British Interplanetary Society, that is the heritage of the guys who have always been involved with thinking about these things, thinking about the future. And that's really the heritage from which Partly, Project Icarus comes from, so I always like to start from there, changing imagination to reality. Now, the guys in 1938 obviously did their job. Um, in the 70s, the guys in the British Interplanetary Society were thinking, well, the Thermi Paradox, if, if interstellar travel is possible, where are they? Where, where is everybody in the galaxy? Let's think, why is it? Is it, is it because interstellar flight is Im impossible? Well, they thought of that, and they obviously went through the Project Daedalus um, study, a five-year study, and came up with the answer that, uh, looking at these things, they believed, they, showed, they were able to show that interstellar, interstellar travel was at least feasible. I know there's some limitations to design when we look back nowadays, but in the, at the time, they really thought they'd shown that it was feasible. Horrendously uneconomic, but at the, at the time, engineeringly feasible. And that was some of the... Uh, the terms of reference they tried to meet. So I roll forward another 30 odd years, in about 2009 or just before that, people started thinking about Project Daedalus again and what they did then and saying, what can we do now? Can we relook at what they did in Project Daedalus and not just perhaps show that it's a feasible thing to do in stellar travel, but maybe come up, try and redo the design and come up with a credible uh, engineering design and show that it really is possible or practicable. That's, uh, that's what started with P Project Icarus. And it was really an initiative between a few guys from the Tau Zero Foundation and the British Interplanetary Society. I think most of them were members of both or organisations. And we started off in 2009. I'm not in any of these pictures, but I'd like to guarantee that I was there, sat at the front in between Ian Crawford and Martin Fogg. But unfortunately, I seem to be missing from the picture somehow. But you can see some of the people here today, you'll recognize it from the photographs then. And even in the bottom right-hand corner there, some of the old uh, Daedalus team. And Jerry, if he, I don't know if he's around here. Good, he won't be able to tell me off for all the mistakes I make then. He's, is he here? No, good. But there they are. That's, that's the, that was the kickoff for Project Icarus. So I'm in, in the background somewhere, you see some of the old team from Project Daedalus and uh, the new team from Project Icarus. So this is Project Icarus. I, I, I'll stress that a few times because I always like to try and clarify the difference between Icarus Interstellar and Project Icarus. And as we go through, you'll, see, you'll, you'll understand why. So Project Icarus was set up, and I have to say I'm so impressed with how well they kicked off this project. It really set us on a great um, path to achieve some really good goals. And I, I particularly like, if you look at the bottom two uh, points on there, Looking at motivating new, uh, I'm no, I know I don't qualify as a new generation of scientists, but maybe I'm a trainee rocket engineer, rocket scientist. But even, even so, we are, we, we, the, the project has really enthused so many people and done so many good things that it's, it's been worthwhile just for that. They had some requirements, as you should do, and this is what they, they want to do. That you'll recognize some of those project requirements because they, they were carried forward from Project Daedalus and just updated a bit. I like the last comment, you know, look at the milestones as well. I, th I think that was probably one thing that Project Daedalus didn't do very, very well. They didn't look at how we might get to building a, an interstellar starship. So that's one of the things we can we look at with our project. One of the early questions we were often asked is why fusion? Well, of course, we were trying to, we were trying to look at the technical heritage from Daedalus. You know, fusion was seen as a credible option 
near future option, not not today, but near future option to to, fly, to go to the stars. And we wanted to look at the engineering developments over the 30 years and compare it to where they were with Daedalus and where we could get to with, with, with Project Icarus. You're looking at the Daedalus ped pedigree as it says there. I know many people here have many other ideas what might be the first way to go to the stars and we're not trying to say that's it. We're just trying to do a project that can show it's possible and possibly credible and practicable. I had a, a great pro program plan we got started and you can see from this just at the end of 2009 that uh, commenced and we entered into this schedule of all the, all the, the uh, activities we were going to undertake and most of you will recognise those that any of you are, uh, are engineers that have worked on programmes of the like. I've taken that literally from an earlier presentation that I did in 2010 I think so if there's anything that's changed on there I apologise but I wanted to show you that's the original plan we started off with. And we soon generated a number of volunteers, a number of keen people who joined in, quite a few PhD guys, most people had MSCs, um, and we, we calculated how much time we might spend on it, and we, we, we had some consultants to help us and um, support the design, and we, we basically split the work down into 20 modules, which I can show you in, on the next slide, I think. There's the 20 modules. And each module was given a project leader, uh, uh, sorry, a module leader who was responsible for driving forward the investigation from that point of view. Um, to start off with, I was module uh, uh, 10, navigation and guidance. My avionics background sort of suited that quite, quite clearly. And, uh, you know, there's other guys in the audience here who have filled, fulfilled the roles in the other, the other design modules. What I liked, one of the things I liked particularly was they set a sort of design philosophy of, of what, we were tr what we were going to try and do and how we were going to try and do it, literally a philosophy. You know, for example, working out to the worst case scenarios was a good starting point, although I'll tell you a bit more later if I have time, what, what changed on that. Watchwords, for example. The watchwords were things like scientifically credible, engineered, you know, key things like that. For, if, you were th if you weren't sure what to do with your design work, you had to rely on some of those words. And, and some of the other things there, just to help us guide us through the design. I'm just going to, I picked out a few early case studies just to go through with, with them briefly. And I'll say this is not a full suite. And I think I stopped counting when there was something like 70 or 80 different trade studies that have been ongoing. So there's a lot of, a lot of work being created in this project. Um, we, we don't want to fly by like Daedalus. Obviously, that, that would be redundant probably nowadays if you're talking about 35 millimeter telescopes and 74 meter telescopes. They're probably going to, you know, resolve quite well the, your target uh, um, exoplanet or wherever you go. So we're going to need to decelerate into the solar system. So we're looking at options. We started off with a long list there, and that's now been sh shortened to a much shorter list, which we'll come to in a moment. As I say, there's just a few case studies to show you what was what was done at the time. Looked at solar sails, that was another work, piece of work that was done. Um, communications of Pat's over here, I remember him talking about this uh, gravitational lens communication and coming back to me with his, um, his pointing requirements for, as, the as, as being in charge of navigation and thinking, crikey, I've got to meet those sorts of standards, that's going to be hard work. So a lot of work was done on that as well. Um, I think Rob Adams is here somewhere. He looked into the O-Birth manoeuvre, which is going to be potentially one solution to getting a bit of extra energy getting out of the solar system. I, and I won't go into any detail, but it's a, a two-burn manoeuvre where you just dive into the gravity well of the, of the sun and then and, and, and light up, hopefully a long way away from Earth with a fusion engine and uh, fire off out of the solar system. We, of course, looked at... Uh, different primary propulsions, and, and I don't like to tell you this, but we're still looking now, and I'll come on to more detail of why we're, we're still looking at those different uh, propulsion options. And I put this one up specially because I know that uh, we can have a good debate about if you were to supply the fuel that they used in Daedalus, which was deuterium and helium-3, one of the best places to get helium-3 from would be from the, the gas giants, and Daedalus came up with this plan to, to mine helium-3 from the gas giants. And in the Project Icarus team, there's definitely two camps who think that is completely unrealistic, 
and the other guys who are working hard to try and see whether it is feasible and credible to do from today's or near future technology. There's other places we could get helium-3, but uh, uh, probably more limited than the gas giants. And obviously some, some work was done looking at en route uh, propellant. Uh, we heard earlier from Dr. Minovich about uh, the buzzard ramjet. That's obviously a, another potential thing to, to look at. So I, that's just a suite of a certain number of um, basic trade studies we've done quite early on and have, have, have filled our, our Dropbox with data and information. Quite a lot that has, well, quite a bit has made it into peer-reviewed um, publications, but there's still quite a lot that isn't. And I'm, I, in my time as the project leader, I'm hoping to start to release that to be open source material. But uh, that, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the people who, who wrote this, even though they're part of Project Icarus, are, are responsible for this uh, work, and they can say whether it's released or not. But at least, for example, the abstracts of the work we've done, just to show that what we've been working on. Oh, there were, was more work, and I think uh, Kelvin did a lot of this work um, with Rich and Andreas, looking at uh, just modifying Daedalus by changing the number of stages or changing the pulse repetition rate for the ICF system. And that gave us more information of what might be possible for, for an Icarus. Well, one of the key things I remember, and I put this slide up because I, you know, not because I was there, but the 61st IAC in Prague, that was the first time a big group of us got together at a conference and, and presented some of our work. And I, and I think we almost took over a session. And at the time, if you see down the bottom, uh, bottom left of the, the slide, it says Project Icarus colon son of Daedalus. All our presentations used to start Project Icarus colon and then the title of the, of the presentation. And lo and behold, when we're there doing about 10 presentations, it, it always appeared that there was a, a massive Project Icarus uh, presentation, which in fact indeed there was. We also took over the, the office of the IAF president to do some workshop while, uh, t time while we were there. We came up with a couple of uh, proposals that were su subsequently worked on, and I'll, I'll go into some more detail on that. There's some more concept development. This, is ju this just followed out mainly from the stage, multi-stage work. And you see the rudimentary diagrams. That's about the best you could, should be able to do with the engineering work that we've done on the Project Icarus concept. This is slightly more though, this is, uh, it call, it's called development and this is about the most I would like to see of the designs that are shown of the work we've done until we do the detailed, more, more detailed engineering analysis. So obviously on this one here is trying to get the engine source away from the payload as far as possible. Now I put this particular slide, I've taken this slide from that presentation, I, part of that presentation I did at the IAC in, in Prague. I'd like to point out to you that we, it said that we was in the middle of the concept design phase, if you remember from that original program plan, and that would feed into the fa phase four in, in April 2011. We were matching schedule, we were on target. I think you might be able to guess what comes next. I, I, I would just like to say a few words of what extra things we started to try to do, which, which made things really challenging for Project Icarus. Um, obviously, Icarus Interstellar had to be formed. We had finances being handled, we had all sorts of things, and, the, and some of the key people at Project Icarus became the key people in Icarus Interstellar. That's why often there's quite a lot of confusion about which Icarus you're talking about. And, well, I, I take my hat off to them, because they've carried on trying to do the work as well, but that really just distracted them a little bit from the work they could do for the project. And, but the result of Icarus Interstellar, as you can see around, around you today, so that's a fantastic uh, step forward. Something else that came up that I'd like to mention is we all turned up, a big part of us turned up here in the 100-year Starship um, first one, the symposium in Orlando 2011. That's the big group there. And I think I counted about 10 of the people on there are here, uh, here this week. So a great turnout. And again, we were still doing Project Icarus, colon, name of presentation. So it looked like we were all over the place, like a rash. And that, that was a great presence at the, uh, at the uh, symposium. But I don't know if you are too aware of what happened, and I, don't, I can't say too much, other than it was a big distraction from some of the key people in Project Icarus got involved, I, myself included, the bid for the, the uh, um, DARPA awards, the subsequent um, 
fact that we got selected with the other two uh, organisations to, to go into pre-contract negotiations, and then the contract issue. Um, things didn't work out as we might have hoped, but that's, that's life. And, we, and the only thing I can really say is that took some of my key people now as the project leader out of the design work for, I don't know, nine months, 12 months. Meanwhile, I was enjoying myself. I, I'm not a rocket engineer, but I got involved with the uh, Pathfinder and Starfinder uh, precursor missions where we were looking at certain steps that might build to an Icarus type mission. So this is my first chance to try doing some sizing the engine, power, the radiators, doing all those basic equations that some of you are probably very, very familiar with. I, I really enjoyed that and it was a, it, it's been published and it's a, a good piece of work that's going to support me and some other guys that worked on it in our future Icarus work. Pathfinder was a 20 year mission to go 1000 AU based on um, this sort of three mission options. Um, I was optimistic to get it to come back into the solar system, but if we could, then we could, we could simulate you know, an Icarus arriving at another uh, solar system. But the key thing about the, the Pathfinder was that it was a, based on a Vasimir, which we thought gave us some suggestions of what might be good technology to develop towards going towards a, a fusion type engine. So that was useful from that part. And as I say, it gave us some steps to a Daedalus like Insular mission. It, it, we've got published in the uh, Spaceflight magazine, in, in JBIS, and the usual sort of thing. And it was a, a worthwhile um, thing to do. There were serious limitations, especially to do with the, the, the very um, simplistic analysis that we've done. But it was a good starter for people like myself. I mentioned briefly Project Helios, which I like to call the Helios experiment, which really is just an offshoot of Project Icarus. Um, I might go a bit more later on in the panel, but just to say I've had a good, good nine, 12 months shooting ping pong balls around an electro-optics lab, trying to hit it with a laser, which has been quite entertaining. And I think we've managed about a her 10 hertz. Now, remember that Daedalus wanted to go at 250 hertz, which is going to be rather tricky, I suspect. I just want to, so I've, I've told you about what extra we were trying to do and um, one of the things that came up in terms of extra work to that program plan was to have a Daedalus valida validation phase which is one just trying to capture us to do a particular phase of work and uh, that was followed by, uh, it fell, fell out of that was to do something called the primary propulsion selection phase plan. A good thing about this propulsion phase plan is a couple of things turned out that uh, we were able to revise the TO, T TORs they needed just tweaking a bit just to get some, some of the meaning right to mean what we meant them to mean and we were able to write some high level objectives. They're not much that different but they are published on, online so you can read them later. Uh, there's, there's some of the high level objectives. Now does anyone recognise this sort of pr process I'm going through from work at all? I'm leading up to a slight delay to the design work that was going on. There was a lot of um, real good work going on but the design work was being delayed so so that, that I, I, I'm, I'm totally happy with what happened there but in in January when I when I uh, excuse me so in January this year when I was asked to take over I could see we were we were not stagnating we were just the design work had come to a bit of a stop and I wanted something to change that and I, I scratched my head for a few weeks and I'm not sure where it came from, but I suspect it may have come from some other people in the audience, uh, in the team. But uh, we decided to have a, yeah, an internal competition, an internal design competition. The guys couldn't agree on which propulsion system, which fusion propulsion system to use. So if you can't agree, I said, right, let's form a few teams. You design to the concept design level based on your system, and you design on your system. And we ended up. Um, the key parameter is the propulsion system and really the ignition system as well. And we were going to set a target, so this is for October this year, we're going to have a two-day workshop in the British Interplanetary Headquarters in London where, well, actually we're going to do the scrutiny for one month beforehand, so the designs need to be ready in September, and then we're going to share all the designs in the team, and we're going to scrutinise them for four weeks, and then we're going to sit down at that workshop and we're going to move forward with our concept design. 
there's five teams basically working away at the moment, and I'm hoping to have five designs to, to take forward to um, the workshop. If if we've missed some trade space in terms of the propulsion, the different fusion propulsion options, because we counted over 20, I've asked the, uh, the what I call the design uh, consultants team, who was mostly made up of the propulsion system uh, guys, who I didn't want to put in the individual teams, otherwise they would have just done the work, have been advised on different types of propulsion systems. They will. Um, catch, do the catch-all for all the ones that have missed in this design competition and we'll have a propulsion review completed by the workshop as well. There's the teams um, doing some great work and the, the guys along the top row have been absolutely fantastic in what they, they've done in terms of their, their endeavours in the last six months. It was six or seven months to do their work, not long at all. And that meanwhile we've been getting ready for this as well, so well done to them. That, set us on a, that has set us on a new timeline compared to what we were doing in the original programme plan. So, that's what we're doing for this year, the workshop in October, and I hope to turn around that concept design into a preliminary design by the end of the year and have a, a preliminary design review as we planned to do two years ago in, in Chris, uh, at Christmas, before Christmas. That's it, we're going to catch up, we're going to start catching up. So, to catch up with the, the program from timeline originally, we're then going to spend 12, 9 months to 12 months working on the detailed design phase to finish in another workshop in October 2014, which I hope to be in the USA. That's not been finalised yet, but I hope to be in the USA somewhere. And then go for the detailed design review by Christmas. Final integration by summer 2015, and the public launch, hopefully back at the British Interplanetary Society in October 2015. And that will bring us to being about six months, maybe nine months behind the original schedule. But we, we've got to move on from the fantastic trade studies and the research and that we've been doing, and we've got to start making these designs, put them on paper, get them on the computers. That's, that's my goal as the project leader. So. What challenges have I got to the future? The um, one thing I've had while I've been in charge of the project is I've had an unwritten moratorium on new recruits to the to the team. But come October, I want a whole new bunch of recruits. One to reinvigorate any of the people in the current team that uh, maybe haven't got the time to commit to the programme, and maybe just be able to get some extra work done because there's a lot of pressure on a lot of people. The other, I, I'm so tempted, and I know he's not looking at the moment, but I, I keep thinking that we've had a fantastic competition, it's going to work for us, that we really should have another competition for the detailed define, de design phase. But we haven't got the manpower at the moment to make two, three, four teams to work on different detailed designs over the following year from Christmas to Christmas, Christmas to October next year. So I look around, I wonder whether there's anyone out there who would like to take us on, basically. Where's the competition out there? I know we are, we are based on a fusion-based design, but I think come October, I'm going to need some external competition to see how we can push our team to come up with a real good design for next year. I'll leave that with you to think about. I'd like to thank some people. There's an acknowledgement. Uh, I've, I've gone off the ideal rocket equation, so apologies for that. And I'd like to thank the people down at the bottom. And I'm, I'm very happy. I say I'm sorry that I haven't got a design to show you. I've, I've told the design teams I will not allow it to go public until we've got some credible designs done. I want to see that. Before we see all the fancy graphics, I want to see the designs done properly. So that might be not till October. So keep your eyes peeled around then. Thank you very much. We have time for two questions. If you're really looking for new ideas, you need to look at the Widom Larson nuclear process. Okay. Thank you very much. I will make a note of that. Where's yep. I like that sort of question. Jim Bemford, dear. Uh, what are your evaluation criteria? Uh, by that I mean where where are you going to start taking your risks? On the on the uh, concept design or further down for the concept design phase or further down the line concept, 
the concept design phase, we've set, remember the terms of reference and the high level, level objectives. We have set a whole series of evaluation criteria for the workshop, which is agreed by all the team leaders for the sub-team. And they actually are online. I think they might even have been blogged on our website several months ago, so you can actually see them online. But they are de de derived from the terms of reference, the high level objectives, and basically how well each design could meet those uh, requirements. That's the plan. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, next up, we have Robert Kennedy, who is an add-on to our uh, to our schedule. Who's going to? Uh, and I wanted to thank Rob Swinney for for uh, for allowing uh, this this talk to to be inserted into our schedule. He's going to talk to us. Very fascinating topic. Geoengineering is the killer app. App. Здравствуйте, дорогие коллеги. There's a reason, greetings, dear colleagues, and there is, re, there's a reason I'm greeting you in, in Russian. Um, that's because uh, this talk isn't about interstellar travel per se. It's, a, it's about a stepping stone that eventually gets us to a spacefaring civilization, developing the solar system, which gives us the basis to go to another star. Because going to another star is going to be, I think, about as difficult as my co-author Ken Roy's Shell Worlds, something quadrillions of dollars, and, you know, a century of effort. So geoengineering is an is a application, a killer app that can get us there. It's a good reason to build solar sails in space. And the reason I started in Russian and I'm talking about geoengineering is the Ruskies. Are come, have come to the same conclusion. In an act of political will, they decided their National Weather Service, uh, this fellow is the one who invited uh, me to Moscow to talk about the concept that we've been working on since 2000, uh, and only in the last couple of years is it getting legs and starting to take off. Geoengineering was science fiction until just a couple of years ago. And on Capitol Hill, if you mentioned geoengineering more than three or four years ago, you'd have been laughed off the hill. But you'll remember, they used to say that about asteroid impacts. And then on the 25th anniversary of Apollo, within a week of it, Shoemaker-Levy 9 hits Jupiter. No more giggle factor, okay? Well, the same thing is happening with geoengineering, both on this side of the ocean, where Congress realizes that a sufficiently wealthy individual could do geoengineering and not ask anybody's permission. And I'm showing you this Russian stuff because the Russians are doing the same thing. Klimacheskaya doktrina Rosiskoy Federatsi. They agree in an act of will, climate change is happening, and they're looking at um, geoengineering solutions. So uh, a little under two years ago, uh, representing my co-authors, I went to Moscow finally got to meet my uh, business partner. That's her, him and her. Um, I hadn't met him in 19 years of doing business. And uh, there they were at the airport, step off the plane. I'm in Red Square. It was a peak experience. And I thought I was going to go to talk to a couple of dozen people like, the, like in Aosta. And I walk in at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I'm looking at that. So that was quite a thrill. Um, that guy. This is the head of the IPCC. This is my kind host, the last head of the Soviet Union's Weather Service. And this is the current head of the Russian Federation's Weather Service. She's from the World Bank. He's from the UN, uh, all these other interesting people. They're really paying attention to geoengineering. And here are the great kids who ran the conference. They're of an age with you. You should get to know them because you know, you're, you're of a, you're, you're contemporaries, uh, they're as energetic as you are, uh, that's the future. This is a taxonomy of geoengineering techniques, okay? On this axis, you have locus. You have the earth, you have space. On the earth, you go from the sea, land, air, and in space, you go from Leo, geo, to L1. On the top, are the approaches to geoengineering. On the far side, you manage radiation. You, you mess with albedo, you cast a shadow, whatever. On the near side, you manage carbon. 
You either try to figure out ways to get rid of it, capture it and get rid of it, or you uh, avoid emitting it in the uh, first place. Carbon dioxide uh, redu uh, uh, reduction, carbon dioxide avoidance. In space, you can only do avoidance, and that's a subject you all like to hear, space-based solar power. So what we see, I, we could stop here. We see a nexus between the challenge, the human race's energy challenge, the climate change challenge, our desire to go into space, geoengineering, basically you use a giant solar sail to, ca to cast a very pale shadow, just one quarter of 1% uh, reduction in the radiation forcing function, um, cast a shadow on Earth. That takes care of the climate change problem, of global warming. On the sunny side of the sail, this is a little crude model, on the sunny side of the sail, you put po photovoltaics and you beam it to Earth, 10 terawatts, right? That is the view, that was the view from here to there, from there to here, and don't freak out, it's not, I exaggerated the sizes, These, this is the actual size of the Dyson dot, and that is the, re that's actually twice as big as we think the relay is going to be now. The relay would be 50 kilometers in diameter, and that, well, it's still pretty big. It's the size of France or here. It's the size of Texas, right? It's almost a thousand kilometers across, and I've also rendered in the same scale what we think is going to happen to the coastline around here. The blue is the coastline as it exists now, and the red is the coastline by 2100, uh, assuming a one meter rise in sea level, and it could go up more than that. Notice how the area of drowned real estate, I mean, this is just the Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma triangle. Look at that amount of real estate. Just imagine that all over the world in the littoral regions and compare that to the size of the sail. I mean, they're comparable. Where is this? I hardly have to explain this to you. It's at the Sun-Earth L1 point. Not at the L1 point because it's in a radiation levitated non keplerian orbit. It's actually on the sunny side of L1 depending on the sail's density anywhere between half a million to um, uh, a million and a half kilometers or between 2 million and 3 million kilometers from us. And as you can see, the dark shadow does not get to us. Only a very light shadow, which you could not even feel on your skin. That's the basic concept. Why did we come up with a sail the size of Texas? Oh, and one thing I should make clear, I'm using a sail the size of Texas. That's just, this is a talking point, okay? So we can, it's a notional design. Actually, you wouldn't build one giant sail, you would build a school of little ones, right? The first one would be hard and expensive, and you would learn and get better and better and better at it. Uh, incremental progress, incremental revenue and benefits. Why did we come up with something the size of Texas? Well, because this has happened before in a negative way. The Maunder minimum dropped the solar flux by, we think, about a quarter of a percent, and that is what our sale, these are the effects it had on civilization. It was written down. Galileo was alive. Kepler was alive. They took note. Tycho was alive. About three degrees dropped in northern Europe, which is the same magnitude but opposite sign of what the IPCC said would be the global warming by mid-century. You already know all of this stuff, that our technology is completely inappropriate to get this thing off Earth, so, to lift it off Earth. So we either do this with space-based resources or we don't do it at all. And that is why it is the killer app to develop a spacefaring civilization because the day, Apollo program's gone. The days of a top-down fiat government program just pay taxpayer money, you will do this, that's not happening anymore. Politically, that's not happening anymore. Also, the Apollo program is about two to three orders of magnitude smaller than the energy problem. So it's 
it's that approach is okay last thing showing you the radiation forcing functions okay uh, of various contributions by the way this paper is um, in JBIS in the uh, Tennessee Valley uh, special edition of JBIS uh, coming out early next year so you can look up this graph and then that's a system schematic right there's a primary maser the secondary masers right pale shadow okay why did we pick the uh, a receiving a rectennas around the Arctic Circle well because by 2050 the Arctic Ocean will be clear and there's going to be a huge amount of economic and industrial development around there anyway the Ruskies are looking forward to it and that's a place to put your rectennas uh, I'll get I'll get to that in a second okay and there's a picture of the global grid it's based on Buckminster Fuller's idea you know none of the components of this are original well we borrow pieces from everywhere Dymaxion grid high tension transmission network to the earth this right here is the key so we cut the IPC's chart in half stuck in a Dyson dot and you can see its effect on the radiation forcing function in scale to all the other things we know what's going on. So the Dyson dot will knock about three and a half watts per square meter off the forcing function and one-eighth of that is due to the photovoltaics generating clean electricity with no carbon signature. Notice how this block is almost the same as our current coal-fired electricity generation. And that's the value you all know about how to work with politics. It's linear, it's you pay as you go, it's scalable, and above all, it's reversible. If it turns out that we're a little too successful, you move the dot out of the way so the shadow's no longer falling, but the dollars still are from the electricity. And that's it. Spasiba. We have two minutes for questions. I, I, I'm sorry, it's not a question. I just have to respond because we, we had a session last night and I met you for the first time, Robert, and I uh, totally endorse. The, the Daedalus group, uh, what happened was with me after that is that uh, for various reasons I formed my company, which uh, was actually meant to be a general company, but Alan Bond showed me something about Russian absolutism in engineering, I began to understand scientific communism. Now, communism is a, a bad word, but there are good and bad sides to everything. And one of the results was that the perception in the great uh, design bureaus in Russia was that they were going to save the world. Quite genuinely, they thought that. And in 1986, my company, which had been formed two years before with, with uh, some of the Daedalus team as, a, as a directors, did a report for the British government which really showed what they were trying to do with Energia, which was that plus everything else, but solar power satellites, everything that's been discussed before. There is uh, this... Uh, absolutism in, in, in Russian ideology, which has always uh, attracted me. I am not speaking for their political system or their leaders, you understand. I have only survived there by sheer chance and by keeping myself small. But I, I promise you that in the, in the uh, engineers that were, it's all died, or it's dying now, uh, and uh, uh, as it is everywhere and here, that uh, that idealism was there uh, and they really did think this. I, uh, they, uh, there was a paper, what actually happened was in 1985, uh, uh, Tony Martin came to me and uh, they said there was a paper given there by a Russian called Sarkisian, which was, even though they'd not published any details on the Energia launcher, was what they were going to do, which was solar power satellites, uh, control the environment of the earth, the whole thing. Uh, I, I cannot endorse more than what you say about that. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, I, I, uh, I'm not, I am a free market uh, company, but there is uh, some thrill in watching the absolutism of this type of view of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very
very much, uh, Jerry. It's very refreshing to hear uh, stereotypes. Thank you. Great. You know, with that. Thank uh, you for we your don't time. have we don't have time for another question. Uh, can I can I please have uh, can we we are next? I would like to invite uh, Jim Benford to to give us a talk on uh, shouting to the galaxy, the Medi debate. I've been personally looking very forward to this talk. There it is. This has got laser too. Well, it's not that great. It's the red yeah, light. Yeah, you're right. Um, I'll keep it. All right. And I'll take this. Do you remember out which way to go? Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, a couple of remarks. That what the Russians really used to enter JF-04 in 1986 was to launch a laser weapon into orbit, uh, not widely known, which was ordered by Gorbachev to be deorbited. Uh, interesting piece of history. The, uh, I'm going to talk about something I referred to yesterday in the panel, the Medi debate. The, uh, Medi is messaging, is the opposite of searching. Uh, it's a debate that's been uh, on a small screen so far, uh, but is, I think, is and should be much larger debate uh, in the near future for several reasons. Uh, I want to dedicate this t talk to my friend, John Billingham, who got me interested in this topic years ago. He was the father of the American SETI program and ran it uh, until uh, it was extinguished by the Congress. Uh, he said that transmission to other civilizations would be a diplomatic act and an activity that should be undertaken on behalf of all humans, which is not what's being done today. Unfortunately, John Billingham died 11, year, 11 days ago. Here's a photograph of him with me and my wife and our good friend, John Anderson. I'm the only American in this picture, although it's taken in the Sierra Mountains. Uh, John was a terrific guy, and I'm glad he got me interested in this. Now, this is basically what it's about. Um, there's, is there somebody looking at us? Well, maybe we should wait back. Now, that's what a lot of people believe. The Royal Society, the one in Britain, uh, produced a, uh, had a debate in this marvelous 17th century estate, the Kavli International Center in Buckinghamshire. Shire. The, uh, and uh, that's a picture of me with protective gear. Uh, and it's a, it's a beautiful place. They spent millions upgrading it. The only thing old is the facade. Everything, there's Wi-Fi everywhere. It's wonderful. You should, if you ever get a chance to go to invent there, go. This, these are the debaters. In the middle is Dominic Martin, or rather Martin Dominic, a man with two first names. The, uh, and he, he ran the debate in favor of open transmitting, unregulated, unsupervised, and, uh, and a free-for-all, is uh, uh, Stephine Dumas from Canada, Alexander Zaitsev from the, the Crimea, uh, Ukraine, and Seth Sochak from the SETI Institute in the US against open transmitting and in favor of talking it over before shouting to the cosmos are David Brin, the science fiction writer, Michael McCown, a retired diplomat from the State Department, and myself. Uh, I was substituting for John Billingham and handling the quantitative side of things. Now the issue is, should we beam out to the galaxy and announce ourselves? Uh, uh, yes or no. And then in that case, who should do it and what should they say? Now, it's not widely known that people have been doing this for almost 40 years. Uh, here's the uh, Evapatoria message, 1999, the Cosmic Call 1, don't let, ask me to read it to you, uh, uh, radiated by Alexander Sitsev, a radio astronomer who is ideologically very much in favor of shouting at the cos cosmos. And that's the telescope. Um, uh, this is the number of messages sent since 1974 up through 2009. There have been several sent, and none of these have ever been received. I'll get to that. The, um, not because they can't get there, but because they can't be heard. The basic argument for messaging is, one, interstellar travel is impossible not an assertion to be widely believed by this audience. And, and an assertion is not proven in their, in their documents. Oh, I should say that I'm the editor of the publication of the papers 
of this debate and the rebuttals to those papers by those authors, which will be published in the near future in JBIS. Uh, and I, I invite you to read those arguments carefully and take sides. Um, so they say we should announce our presence to the nearer stars because if nobody transmits, there's no communication, the cosmic club does not form, and so we just be, be good, uh, we would be good citizens of the galaxy if we were to start talking. Why no one else is talking is left unexplained. The idea of danger they maintain from physical or electronic communication is silly, they say. Uh, they, uh, they, they think that you cannot really uh, prohibit people. You can't stop people from messaging. And in fact, nobody ever has tried to stop them. Uh, and they also say that leakage from Earth has already announced us, as Sochak said in an in a unguarded moment, by people have heard us a thousand light years away. Notice we haven't been radiating for more than 50, 60 years in, in a substantial power. Um, the argument against messaging is leakage radiation cannot be detected, or has not been detected in nearby stars if you actually do the numbers. I'll come back to these points later. And that humanity should first reach a consensus on what to do about METI, that is, do we want to send or not, and then what to say, and, and what we should do about future, future leakage from Earth, which I think is going to increase. We're probably at a minimum right now in in, ra in free radiation. Uh, and the, the searching, the SETI program, is far cheaper than messaging the METI program. The objective, they say, is not prohibiting messaging. It's to agree on whether and how to announce ourselves. And that includes the possibility of deciding not to. Now the motives, now that's, those are the positions, but what are the motives <coughs> of the people in the debate? Well, they, they, the people uh, who want to build beacons and announce our presence uh, say, hey, we've gotten quiet lately because of uh, fiber optic communications, so we should make ourselves more visible. Uh, this contradicts the idea that we've already made ourselves visible, which they also maintain. Uh, we can better understand what we're looking for in SETI if we develop our own concepts for transmitters. That's certainly true, and I've done a lot of work on that myself. Now, the objection made to METI is that it actually poses a danger. As David Brin famously said, it may be unwise to shout in a jungle. That presumes we're actually in a jungle. Uh, and perhaps not all civilizations will be benign, as they are not here. Uh, cultures are not here. Also, the inter interstellar invasions or infections are not realistic fears. They agree on that, although the uh, people who advocate METI keep talking about Darth Vader and things like that, uh, Klingons and such. But at that, the, the people who are opposed to METI are not saying we're going to be invaded. They're saying the, that contact with even a benign civilization could mean societal stress for the Earth, uh, a culture shock, as I referred to yesterday when I was on the panel. That the cultural values could be shaken. Uh, in human history, first contact has seldom been easy for the less developed culture and that we are at least 50-50 chance of being the less developed culture. Now, I hope you can read that table, but I did a lot of calculations on Zaitsev's messages. Now, uh, he had, uh, his radiating power was at peak in his strongest message, 150 kilowatts, which is not very big, and it's a 70 meter dish, uh, about five gigahertz frequency. I calculate that with the be biggest, best, most sensitive tele radio telescopes of Earth, uh, the range for intercepting that message and seeing it as a message is three light years. There's nothing within three light years, so it will not be heard. The range, uh, if you had an SKA scale, the square kilometer array, uh, a radio telescope we hope to build and are not, frankly, building now because the money's not there, but it's a kilometer on the side, much bigger than anything we've got now. The range is 19 years. Now, that's taken positively by the, pe the people who favor radiating, but I would point out that Zaitsev's messages were directed at stars between 32 and 70 light years away, and therefore, even with an SKA, they wouldn't be able to hear it. Uh, if you say, well, never mind the message, what about just the, the fact that they could de detect coherent energy if they 
integrated over time, the, then the range goes way up to 108 light years for Earth telescopes and 648 for, uh, for an SKA. The problem with that is you'd have to distinguish it from other apparently coherent but not message burdened uh, transmissions such as pulsars of which there are many thousands in the galaxy. Uh, there are a lot of coherent signals that are seen because they're produced by artificial, uh, by natural methods, not artificial. And there would be, at, at, in the range is shown here, uh, no way for ET to tell that Zaitsev's message was a message because all he would get was a, a coherent buzz. So the, uh, the, uh, you, it would, they would have to have much bigger uh, uh, radio telescopes in order to be able to, to make anything out of uh, Zaitsev's messages. <clears throat> now, what would have to, have to happen for that message to really be received? The receiving system has to stare at a very, very, very small part of the sky, like a millionth or a billionth of the sky, and it has to wait. It has to integrate the signal over time and it would have to guess what the bit rate of the message is and compare it to various kinds of signal processing stratagems, of which we have many here. He used a, a BFSK, I'm sure that comes trippingly to your mind, uh, binary frequency shift keying method, which is, was popular at one time here, and uh, it's one of many. And so, the, but they could, they could process the signal and keep trying and perhaps bring the message up if they had done all that staring at this spot in the sky. Uh, now, they could occur, but they're no, not certain to occur, especially if you've gotten something you're not sure if there's a message in there at all, and it looks like a pulsar. So it's a very iffy proposition to pick that up because it's really not a very powerful signal. Now, on the question of leakage radiation from the Earth, there's been really a lot of back and forth about that and a lot of discussion. The original work by Sullivan in 1978 still shows they were really not very visible out there because things like TV stations, the famous I Love Lucy statement, the aliens are looking at I Love Lucy now because it was broadcast 50 years ago, is just nonsense because TV transmitters are not coherent with one another. They average out very quickly. The, the range to, to see a transmission for a radio trans, from a TV transmitter here is less than the distance to Pluto. So not going to be seen outside the solar system. Um, uh, Parks could not see video leakage from Earth at Alpha Centauri, and at 50 kilometer range, the antenna would have to, 50 light year range, the antenna would have to be about a kilometer in di diameter, far, far larger than anything we have built. It's not that you can't build it, uh, but if you did, why would you look at that tiny place in the sky um, and expect a message from it when you probably built it for radio astronomy? After all, very few, very little time is spent you know, with our radio telescopes looking for messages. Um, uh, over the horizon radars are a popular assertion that they're, they're visible way a, a long way off. That's really very doubtful. Most of the radar energy is absorbed into the, into the soil of the Earth. It's pointed at the horizon. It's rotating on the Earth. And so it would be seen just as a flash uh, at great distances and a flash that would not naturally repeat because the Earth's going around the sun, so the Earth's ro rotating around both the sun and, it, and its own axis. And so it doesn't repeat very often, and it isn't a message, you know. What's more, contemporary radio uh, uh, ra radars are not actually uh, uh, the same ones that were used in the past. They are less powerful and they're lower frequencies. They use uh, different kinds of uh, transmissions. They're, they're now broadband. Uh, and they're basically undetectable at range. They're not made to be detected. They're made to do a completely different job. Interplanetary radars, on the other hand, could possibly be detected but are unlikely to be seen because they don't actually typically radiate in the plane of the ecliptic. They radiate at asteroids, which are randomly uh, uh, distributed in the sky, and take up very, very, very small part of the sky. If you do the numbers, you find out the probability of intercepting it is cons considering the overlay of the asteroids against the stars. There is very, very ridiculously low probability that such in, in, uh, signals would ever be s seen around a star simply from the solid angle uh, argument. So it's my contention and several others that we have not announced ourselves to the stars. We haven't been seen. And for initiating a conversation is something we have time to talk about. 
I want to point out that there are, is going to be more leakage in the future if we start using power beaming for, on the left, the solar power satellites, on the right, uh, that is a microwave-driven rocket being launched into orbit, an experiment which will be done for the first time next month, by the way. And uh, those will have side lobes and leakage that will be much more intense than anything we've done in the past. And that might really be observable. And we should think about that and uh, consider uh, that as one aspect of whether we build these things. And if we do, where we're going to point them. So, to contrast beacons with transmitters, I would say basically, to move right along, that uh, uh, searching is a whole lot cheaper because you can search a volume that's one to two orders of magnitude larger than you can beam to for the same cost. That's the basic argument. And one or two orders of magnitude in cost is a serious matter. Imagine your own income were to go up by one or two orders of magnitude. It would be a really big impact, right? Uh, so it's more expensive to transmit. So why the concern? The concern is not about those messages that have been sent in the past. The, message, the concern is, what about the future? A very wealthy person, just as a wealthy person, a previous speaker said, could uh, do his own, his own geoengineering, a wealthy person can build a true beacon that it can be observed at serious range and begin to transmit to speak for Earth. Now, what would that person say? promulgate religion. That's what previous large projects did, like the pyramids, like the cathedrals. And we see people promulgating religion all over the planet now. I thought 50 years ago religion was on the way out. I was wrong. Uh, uh, and would he announce our existence and invite people over? That's really where the question lies. It's not about the silly little messages of the past. It's about what someone could do if they decided to because there are enough wealthy people in the world. We have uh, oh, uh, millions of millionaires, uh, hundreds of billionaires. Uh, in, the near, uh, in the next few decades, we will see the first trillionaire. They could do this if they wanted to. How do you build a beacon? Well, we know how to do that on Earth, actually. Uh, you have arrays of antennas and arrays of sources. And as I pointed out the other day in my talk about, uh, uh, how about power beaming with to sales, there's a way to calculate the optimum cost and we know how to do economies of scale, and the result is that beacons cost a lot of money. Here, as a function of range, is the cost in billions of dollars, that's with the B, not a T, not an M, but a B, of continuous radiation or short pulsed uh, irradiation, which I think is more observable, actually. And you can see that at the range of 1,000 light years, you're still sp spending billions of dollars to really get out there and announce yourself. So it can be done, but it is expensive. On the other hand, the cost of the SKA, which can see, see out to roughly 30, 40,000 light years, far longer than this, is $2 billion. So there, that's where that one to two orders of magnitude in cost per star seen or, or transmitted to, that's where that ratio comes from, is the fact that SKA is supposed to cost $2 billion, which no one has put up yet. Now, what have people proposed to do about this? I've proposed that the first thing we should do is document what we've done already. Make up a database, make it publicly available, and insist on a peer-reviewed publication standard announcement of what's been done in the past. Uh, the people who've done things in the past are strangely reluctant to do this. They publish uh, things about what they've done, ZSEV in particular, but they don't really give you the details, not enough to actually calculate their range because they don't want you to know that the range is very short. Okay, this, you need to know things like what's the noise temperature you're, you're assuming, what's the signal to noise ratio you're assuming on the point of the receiver, uh, what antenna areas the receiver have, uh, what's, uh, what, what's the bandwidth of your signal? What's your uh, bit rate? Uh, what's your structure of bits? How are, you, uh, how are you doing this? They don't typically say that. As HSEV says more than others, the typical radiated uh, signal is essentially unknown to us. So I, we think the first step is let's get people to document what they're doing and have done or proposed to do. And that we, uh, Billingham in particular, 
the late lamented John Billingham advocates that there be international symposia bringing a lot of disciplines, talk over, are we going to radiate, in which case, what, do we, what message do we send? These the topics covered should be technical and sociological, and we should try to reach some kind of consensus and uh, ask the questions, should this be left in the hand of individuals or small groups or national organizations or transnational organizations? Should there be informal or formal agreements between nations about taking action to resolve risk issues, which means ultimately some kind of enforcement mechanism about radiation? And how would you translate that into action? These are not simple, easy questions. They're social questions. An example is that in the year 2000, there was a declaration of principles made that was to, from a committee in the UN to the UN, uh, and it, uh, it's still sitting on the table. And it said, don't uh, respond to a signal we receive until we've consulted with each other. Now that means after reception, but uh, the opponents of, uh, of METI of messaging feel that there should be consultations now about before transmitting to people without having received anything. And they advocate a moratorium on messaging, serious messaging, until such an international consensus is reached and that the proper possible organizations for that would be given in this list of which the, probably the best place is the International Astronomical Society. Uh, and and the, the worst case probably is the UN, which hasn't acted on the original protocol uh, of 13 years ago. So, the, in conclusion, this is an issue that really should be debated, and there's a possibility that we're really going to get announced by somebody, so maybe we ought to talk it over. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have three minutes for questions. Dave Messerschmidt? Yes. Dr. Messerschmidt. Yes. Professor Dave Messerschmidt, UC Berkeley. On the uh, danger issue, which was raised prominently in last night's panel session, it would be really helpful if the Icarus community, or more generally those working on interstellar travel, would tell us um, how far it might be credible to go on interstellar, interstellar travel. If the answer is, well, anything over, say, 10 or 15 light years is just totally beyond feasibility, then I would argue it's perfectly safe to communicate Medi-wise with civilizations that are 100 or 1,000 light years away. If, on the other hand, the community says, well, we're not going to go farther than four or 10 light years in the near term, but in the very long term, we could envision scenarios by which we could travel toward the center of the galaxy or even to other galaxies, then that would inform the debate in a very different way. So I, I would just put in a good word to the community to think about that issue. I've been listening throughout this uh, symposium and I haven't heard any uh, sort of definitive uh, answer on that. It probably isn't a definitive answer. Well, well, I think Al Jackson had an answer yesterday. He said, if you really think about Kardashev, uh, two or three civilizations, there really is no outer limit on the range. That's kind of scary uh, that, that one can travel. And it makes the Fermi paradox even more uh, substantial and mysterious. There's other question. One more question. Um, we'll have... Uh, all right. Okay. <laughs> it actually is. And this is just a straw man thought experiment, but given the difficulty of um, uh, mandating that someone not send a, a, a regular signal, what about a masking strategy where a random pulse is sent in order to drown that signal? Oh, to counter it? Yeah. yeah so it becomes a form of electronic warfare. Uh, well, you know, th I don't think anyone suggested that before. That's a, that's a new idea. It's a good idea. I mean, it would be easy enough to say, hey, you're free to radiate, and we're free to counter you. You and me have to say a thing. Yeah, you radiate the same message 180 degrees out of phase. It just cancels out exactly. <laughs> uh, Pete, last question. 
That, so the, that last question uh, brought to mind two things that I think would be interesting. One is if you were to not assume that, that you're a type 2 civilization, but just that you're the class of civilization that can credibly design a Icarus or a Daedalus, you know, I, I wonder what our warning would be if one of those were coming our way without breaks. Uh, but, the, but the second thing uh, with regard to um, what you bring up in terms of a convention. Yesterday, there was a discussion on perhaps uh, starting a larger discussion on a succeeding regime to the Outer Space Treaty. And this is certainly one of the things that we could think about in a revised Outer Space Treaty, which is how do you uh, look at things like this? And certainly there, there are technical monitoring capabilities of some nation states that would know if active messaging was happening against the convention. Mm, thank you, yes. Uh, as for the incoming Daedalus with no brakes, that is not decelerating, no rocket on, uh, the detectable signature would be the synchrotron radiation from the bow shock, which would be determined only by the, the density of the interstellar medium and the local interstellar magnetic field and the velocity of the craft. And so it's quite a discernible uh, thing. We see a lot of synchrotron radiation. There are a lot of jets in astronomy. Uh, and so it's a, it's a quantifiable thing that you could look for if you really felt uh, paranoid. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, we are very excited to come to the point in the program where we can announce the Alpha Centauri Prize. So I'd like to call the the uh, awarding committee to to the front, please. At some point, huh? We we would like before before we break because this is this is going to be brief. We thought that we could award it now. We can call it an unofficial in in seat break while they while we get organized here.
Ladies and gentlemen, this has never been done before. An award for the best paper in this field. You may want to get your you may want to get your cameras ready because I just glimpsed at the winner and I'm I'm uh, tingling with excitement. So uh, I do not want to delay any further at all. I'm going to turn this over to Kelvin. The Alpha Centauri Prize, Icarus, the Institute for Interstellar Studies, and Icarus Interstellar. Here we go, Kelvin. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you. So, thank you very much. This is a really exciting and the second prize being announced this week. And I'd like to thank Icarus Interstellar for sponsoring this award, which we're calling the um, Progeny Award for the paper which has the most potential to impact interstellar flight. Um, over the next hundred years, economically and technologically. We had three judges, Dr. Rachel Armstrong, Dr. Ian O'Neill, and Paul Gilster, um, very distinguished people in their field. They scored it according to qu requirements that we set out. Um, we were excluded from the judging, and so the, it is their opinion um, that we've come to. And um, we have um, Andreas Hein, who's going to be awarding the award on behalf of the Institute for Interstellar Studies. And we have Dr. Richard Abusti, who's going to be presenting the check on behalf of Icarus Interstellar. So, without further ado, um, I'd just first of all like to say that the Alpha Centauri Prize um, has much more ambitious um, aspirations in terms of launching design competitions around the world. So, this is the first of the prizes. So, let's get it moving. So, um, if we'd like to go over to um, Paul Gilster. Thank you, Kelvin. Uh, prizes, as we know, have a wonderful stimulating effect on technologies and driving ideas forward. History is filled with many examples of that. I have seldom been a judge in a prize contest, and I must say it is an, a taxing process. I went through all the presentations myself and gave them all, ranked them all numerically on a scale and tried to work out what would happen and what I thought was the best choice. I think we all did that. We surprised each other, I think, in certain respects, and it was inevitable that we would come down with, uh, with disagreements on some and agreements on others and try to average all that together to find the best choice, which we have done. Uh, I congratulate uh, the Institute for Interstellar Studies on this concept of, of uh, producing a prize that will be awarded uh, at each of these sessions and move significantly forward as it grows. And Icarus Interstellar is owed great thanks for putting up the uh, cash prize to make this possible. So thank you very much. Um, first and foremost for me, um, I've been to a lot of conferences and uh, meetings, and this is the first time that I can say I can see a movement. There is this consolidated effort towards this very ambitious goal. I mean, we're not just one space here, we're talking inter interstellar space. So when I was asked to be a judge on this, I jumped at the chance, because to be a part of that cycle, presenting a prize for uh, interstellar studies, that's a phenomenal thing to be involved with. And as we were going through all the... Um, the, 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 the candidates for the, for, the, for the prize, I was surprised by how much we agreed on the winner and, and the, and the, and the runners-up. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Icarus and Stellar. I've been with you guys from, from initiation, really. Yeah, it's, been, it's been three or four years, and I never thought in a million years back then that it was possible to do a, a meeting like this. Um, so I just want to thank everybody, everybody on my track, superb. It was wonderful to do the near term, mid term, and, and far term with interstellar studies. And I'm just very proud to be a part of this movement. During this event, time and space have literally collapsed. In three days, we've gained snapshots of the status of interstellar exploration, now, this lifetime, and in the future. And for me, this conference unfolded with a silent storm of trailblazing solar sail presentations by Jim Benford and Les Johnson, who not only blew me away with their vision, but also carved a wake of expectations for this conference that has set a superbly high bar for others to follow. 
but indeed they followed and they also shone in the reflected light and I'll just mention a couple of the presentations that um, are not about the technology that we need to achieve interstellar flight but in the associated disciplines that I think have become very prominent um, how much we need them if we're to address the complex equation of interstellar flight that is also incredibly multidisciplinary. So Armin Papazian's take on economics and the proposal for an interstellar base literally brought me to my feet, not only in terms of its enabling vision, but also in terms of its inspiring delivery. And also Sarah Jane Pearl's shining artistic exploration that was evocative, that went beyond words to help us remember and develop the human factor, lest we leave it as a second place to the machine. So it is now my great pleasure to announce the shortlist in reverse order and the uh, prize um, as uh, we have uh, jointly um, agreed um, we will place these uh, speakers. So in third place um, I'd like to hear um, a round of applause for Dr. James Benford on his presentation for Solar Sail Ships. In second place, we've um, chosen Heath Resbeck and Nick Nielsen for their existential risk for interstellar advocacy. <laughs> and in first place, um, we would like to award the prize to Armin Papazian for Money Mechanics for Space. Is Dr. Pays in here? conference was an economics conference if my paper would have actually won this award. <laughs> um, but I'm very moved, I'm very touched and uh, I really hope that we actually get to implement it and fund your projects and really achieve the evolution we all must ensure that um, uh, we deliver to our own children. Thank you. So we will now break for, for 10 minutes uh, and uh, when we return we're going to have the Icarus Interstellar project lead uh, panel up here in the front, 10 minutes.
Hello, everyone. So we'll start up the session again. This time, I'd like to invite all of the project leaders from Icarus Interstellar to come to the front table, please. Just as we get settled, I wanted to say a couple of words of how how Icarus Interstellar has evolved its its projects. It's been a it's been a very organic uh, process. Um, starting from Project Icarus, we saw that some of the in order to frame the problem, we had to address many many aspects, ever increasing aspects. So um, when uh, when, for instance, the the question or the concern of whether or not we should just be looking at fusion propulsion, whether, whether we, should, we should be dedicating some of our efforts towards sales, uh, that sort of turned into a whole other project and James Benford formed uh, project, project Forward and built a team around him. Uh, and of course, the, the fact that we're, Project Icarus was, uh, follows as a heritage from, from Daedalus is necessarily a robotic mission, an automated robotic mission. Uh, there's always some, uh, some uh, there's always that inherent will that we want to see humans on inhabited, crude, uh, crude spacecraft, because that's what we're heading towards. So, what exactly are the stakeholders, and how would we start to frame those problems? So, Andreas Hein uh, uh, was really passionate about this, and you know, uh, formed a team and launched the project. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Rachel Armstrong, who's unique background and, and just virile imagination, you know, and, and the scientific work that she does is so perfectly uh, attuned to, to looking at and trying to understand exactly what the interior or what the ecosystem inside the world ship would be. That's how these, these projects have been initiated. And um, we are, uh, we can still, I think I saw Jim Benford outside, if someone can grab him. Uh, uh, I will start with uh, Richard Obusi, who's going to give us a uh, talk on next before, which uh, I'll let you introduce. I'll let you. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I get started, I think it'd be quite insightful just to give you a little bit of a feel um, for the structure of Icarus Interstellar, and I think that will help frame who, who's on the stage um, and, and where that fits within the organisation. So. Um, we're a 501c3 uh, non-profit organization. We have a number of committees, and for lack of a better word, they're bins uh, where, we, you know, where people sort of sit, and, and it helps us kind of, in our mind, um, figure out what, our, you know, what we're focusing on. So the um, committees in Icarus, we've got a research committee, um, a public outreach committee. Uh, who, we inter the, the public outreach committee, for example, is responsible for, for the blogging and for the news articles and for the press releases. Um, we have a fund development committee, um, Starflight Academy, which is um, focused on uh, 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 academics. Um, we have an advisory board and Farmaker, which is our, our creative, uh, creative outreach division. So within the research committee, there are a number of projects. So uh, you heard earlier um, from Rob Swinney, um, who's project lead for Project Icarus, and then we've got Andreas Hein, who's project lead for Hyperion, uh, Rachel, who's project lead for Persephone, and XP4, Experiment X Physics Power and Propulsion Program. Um, it's really that component of Icarus in Estella which wants to entertain uh, and embrace the notion of some of the more exotic stuff um, that we're that we're interested in. So, you know, we've had a number of good presentations over the last three days, um, giving uh, good reasons um, to send probes to other stars. So there's some great scientific reasons. Um, there's the study of the interstellar medium, astrophysical studies of a target star, uh, planetary science studies, um, and astrobiological studies. And then there's some other motivations, one that I, ones that I find particularly compelling. So uh, the longevity um, of humanity, uh, and simply an expression 
um, of a curious um, and energetic species. But it's going to be it's going to be hard. It's going to be expensive, and it's going to take us a long time. So you know, one of the things that, that we understand is that the stars are are, are very very distant. Um, so the closest star, a little over four light years. Um, so we're looking at um, decades, centuries, and millennia. And so what XP4 is interested in, or a component of XP4 is interested in, is can we bring that, can we bring that trip, trip time down by being ingenious with how we, you know, how we utilize the laws of physics? And I think one of the ways that's valuable to think about this problem is to think about how far we come on such a short time scale. And one example that I think is particularly revealing is the experimental validation of the subatomic, of the atomic structure of matter. So, as you know, atoms consist of electron, an electronic shell, and a nucleus of protons um, and neutrons. And it wasn't until 1897 that J.J. Thomson discovered, experimentally validated, the electron. Uh, in 1917. Rutherford experimentally verified the proton, and in 1932, um, Chadwick discovered the neutron. Now, from the full experimental validation of the substructure of matter, or the structure of matter, it was only about 30 years later that we took this understanding of matter and were able to create a remarkable propulsion system, nuclear propulsion. This is within a generation or two of not even knowing, not even experimentally validating the physics to the creation of a nuclear rocket. And that to me is phenomenal and it's inspiring. And so, you know, one of the things that I always try and remind myself when I think of the interstellar problem is that we have a tendency to, well, we have a tendency to overestimate what we can accomplish on short time scales, but we have a tendency to underestimate what we can accomplish on long time scales. And what I mean by that is, you know, whenever I'm involved in a project, I, I think to myself, okay, this is going to take me a couple of months, and eight months later, I'm just wrapping it up. So we have a tendency to underestimate how long things will take on short time scales. But I mean, I think this progression of technology is remarkably revealing. 1903, this flimsy contraption, the flight of the Kitty Hawk. 1957, 4th of October, the uh, Sputnik, the first artificial satellite. 1969, Neil Armstrong steps foot on the moon. And then now, around about the year 2000, or around the 2000s, an orbiting space, space station, ladies and gentlemen, within one short century. So that, to me, is what's you know, particularly inspiring and gets me excited about what we might accomplish over the next, uh, over the next few decades. Something else that gets me excited is the relationship between theoretical physics and technology. So, for example, over a hundred years ago, James Clerk Maxwell codified the theory of electromagnetics, yet we're still finding remarkable things to do with this. Theoretical physics, electromagnetism, formed the foundation of modern technology, um, cell phones, um, television, radio, radar, and the same for a number of other branches um, of theoretical physics as well. So quantum mechanics led to integrated circuits and computer technology. Um, thermodynamics is what's the underlying physical basis for jet engines and cars. So what of the theoretical physics today? Grand unified theories, super string theory, dark energy, dark matter, the Higgs boson. What is the theoretical physics of today? What will that lead us into to in terms of the technology um, of tomorrow? And so something I think is particularly interesting is that the era that's responsible for the creation of ultimately the nuclear rocket, that the era that made the experimental determination, it's this era. It's Victorian England, the late 1890s, men were still running around or riding around on penny farthings. And so I think equally, the era that creates the, the, the warp drive, if that ever happens, is going to look back on our modern era in the same way. And so XP4, the X Physics Propulsion and Power Project. So some of the things we're interested in um, are vacuum energy, metric engineering, uh, and the utility um, of extra dimensions. And uh, it's, it's a program that is in, is in its embryonic stages. Um, I'm the project lead for it, but I've been um, obsessed with getting everything sorted for, for Starship Congress. That's taken a, a large fraction of my time. Um, but one of the things we want to do over the coming two years is launch an R&D program um, dedicated to making the kinds of breakthroughs um, in, in propulsion technology based on 
space-time manipulation. And some of the early things we can do, for example, are metamaterial experiments to simulate exotic space-time. So metamaterials are a new form of material that have been discovered um, that have something called a negative index of refraction. And that allows us to do some remarkably interesting experiments. Specifically, we can uh, uh, use metamaterials to simulate exotic space-times like the Alcubia metric. And so just to be clear, we wouldn't actually be creating the Alcubia drive, for example, or the Chung Freeze metric uh, that Dr. White is interested in, but instead of experimentally, uh, ex instead of simulating them numerically on a computer, we can actually do physical experiments uh, with these me metamaterials. Um, and ag again, we're interested in examination of the quantum vacuum for propulsion and power. Other things we want to do over the next two years is really build advocacy for this kind of research. Um, uh, within the, th the theoretical physics community and, and the broader community as well, to really sensitize the, uh, the, the world to the kind of activities that we're interested in, and ultimately grow a world-class technical and professional uh, workforce to pursue uh, these, the, these problems. Uh, this is the Icarus Interstellar XP4 team. So we've got Dr. Jerry Cleaver, uh, Dr. Eric Davis, Dr. Sonny White, uh, myself, um, Jeff Lee, um, Tiffany Frierson. Of course, they all work independently. Uh, uh, Jerry's at uh, Baylor University, um, uh, Eric in the Austin Institute for Advanced Study, um, uh, Sonny's at uh, NASA, obviously. Jeff Lee's a teacher um, in Toronto and so forth. But, you know, this is a, uh, the, the nucleation point for a team um, that we want to grow. And, you know, one of the things we want to do ultimately in the long, long term is create. Um, a lab for this, a non-profit operating foundation which maintains that long-term vision of XP4. And, you know, we want to create a structure that maximizes the collaboration between the uh, uh, theoretical and experimental research. And uh, you know, we think that this approach, this synergistic approach, um, is going to allow us to extend the theoretical areas of investigation while experimentally validating the predictions of the research. So I think that's important. I think it's important that the experiment drives the theory and not the other way around, and we need to keep the two sort of moving, moving forward together. And so our proposed strategy, we need to develop um, over the coming uh, few months a technology roadmap uh, with, a, with a full and complete identification of the status and activity of research. And from that, we can determine where to best focus um, our early efforts over the coming years. Uh, next, we need to create a roadmap for the initial plan of activities. And we already actually have a proprietary theoretical program um, that's in the quite advanced planning stages, um, including FTL stimulations using metamaterials um, and metric engineering. So that's a summary of uh, XP4 within Icarus and Estella. Thank you very much. Here I am again. The uh, uh, project forward, uh, the, the basic objective is to try to take Bob Forward's ideas for uh, sales and make them, uh, bring them into the 21st century. Uh, the, we had a, a meeting about it on uh, Thursday evening and codified uh, the way forward, no pun intended. The uh, essential thing is to try to deal with the outstanding problems. Uh, that the issues that are unresolved, and I mentioned them in my talk on Thursday, but let me go through them and, and say, here's, here's where we're going to attack. <coughs> on interstellar sa sales themselves, there are a lot of issues. Before we do that, we have to recognize that we are talking ultimately about building a space architecture that starts with lower power missions uh, in nearer space, even low Earth orbit, and, and goes through a ladder of development, building up power beaming capabilities for a variety of reasons. The chief virtue of that method is that photons transfer energy through gravitational wells without loss, whereas moving energy in the form of mass takes a lot more energy because of gravity and is a lot slower. The Ladder I mentioned on Thursday would start with launch into orbit, but can then lead to orbit raising to things like Mars fa fast track, which I uh, uh, outlined very briefly, and, and on through there. And ultimately, you get to where you have fast sails leaving the solar system and going out toward the stars. Now, where are the issues there that we really need to focus on? 
uh, and we've we've kind of uh, we've high, put them in a hierarchy, and I want to mention them in no particular order. But the um, the the first one would be uh, how do you how do we guarantee we've got enough pointing accuracy to carry out the mission for the acceleration time we need? We know what the present state of the art is, but we need to enhance that. And what can we borrow from the astronomical community and the directed energy weapon community that would help us in that question? Uh, the, the next thing would be how do we maintain communications with the sale? How do we do data transfer? We have, no one's really looked at that before. It's, it's a bit daunting over interstellar distances and we have to figure out how we could do that. Now, it may be that the answer to some of these is you can't do that. That's all right. That's what research is for, to try to find out whether the problems can be solved or, and to find a solution. Until you face the realities, you can't get around them. I don't mean get around the realities, but find a new reality. Now, the, uh, we need to look really fundamentally at the construction of sales because with the onset of graphene sales, uh, graphene as a material, the n nanotubes, and the sort of uh, micro, -truss, uh, micro truss structures I showed you on Thursday, there are a lot of possibilities in materials that would allow higher accelerations and would allow uh, uh, the use of uh, these materials to make a more and more diaphanous sale and therefore be able to make it lighter and faster. Um, the other uh, factor I want to mention, which is, I think is, is very difficult for all starships, is deacceleration. What do you do at the other end? Flybys are, are yesterday's news. So we, we can't really gain anything from a quick flyby through a, through a solar system. In fact, the data rate you can get out of astronomy from a distance is better than you would get, uh, not just the data rate, the total data capacity is much, much uh, uh, better than what you'd get with a sail coming through at a tenth of the speed of light. Uh, it wouldn't be able to get enough data to make it worth the trip. So uh, there have been a lot of suggestions for s slowing down solar sails. Solar pressure doesn't look like it would work. Of course, it would ultimately, uh, in a developed system, if you had a beamer at the other end, the problem goes away. But you, but you always have the problem of the first trip, and. That means something like maybe the mag sales. I was very interested to, to see the presentation about solving the Bassard ramjet problem by uh, basically strengthening the, the uh, uh, magnetic coil. And, uh, and that was very positive scaling. And of course, the mag sail has a similar problem because it's a magnetic coil as well. And if we can apply those methods, uh, to the mag sail, we might be able to make that a much better uh, candidate for slowing down the uh, the forward sail. So that's a, a quick list of the problems we're addressing, and I think that uh, over the next year we want to try to get preliminary answers to those. And we've got a number of people who are going to be working on them, and teams of people are going to be working on them. And I would hope that. Um, well, let's see, the next meeting of here is, I mean, the next meeting of the Congress is two years from now, so I don't want to take two years to do that, but whenever we meet next, when we few shall meet again, we hope to be able, in the Project Forward, to have some answers for you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll turn it over now to Rob Swinney, who already spoke to us about Project Congress, but specifically we're going to talk about future steps and perhaps what happens, uh, you know, close to the end of the project. Okay, thank you, Andres. Yes, Project Icarus, I'll just say a few more words because I obviously presented just a moment ago, but um, you heard about our, our design competition, which is a critical point in the, in the process that, uh, of getting an actual credible design uh, finished. Uh, this is, I feel, a little bit of a test of the model of using volunteers remotely working together to actually finish a real complicated project. My ambition for the project is for the, the Project Icarus, the final design, or the group that we, I've worked with, will be considered in, in the same light as Project Daedalus and the, the reputation that's developed over the years. So that's the goal for us to try and achieve that sort of standard. Now, I appreciate that Jerry is a real bright guy, and Alan Bond has the brain of si size of a planet, and probably Tony Martin has probably got the brain the size of the solar system, so we're competing with some absolute colossal colossuses from, colossus from the past and that's what we aim to do over the next two and a half years. Um, 
I'll just say briefly about Project Helios while I'm on all the, the Helios experiments. And, and that's stalled because uh, last year I had the opportunity to use a, uh, an electro optics lab in its downtime as it was being closed and moved. So I was fortunate to uh, have that opportunity. So I spent about nine months, a couple of hours a week, playing around in someone's electro optic labs for flu free, which is great. Now, I remember the, the presentation we had a couple of days ago, the chat which uh, talked about crowdsourcing, and I feel that maybe Project Helios or the Helios experiment is exactly ideal to try and find someone out in the, in the sourcing, crowdsourcing um, model to help us out with that one, because I don't have time to take it any further at the moment, and the, the guys working on that have, have dispersed, basically. Um, that's all I'd like to say. I'll pass it on to Andreas. Okay. <clears throat> um, so the main objective of Project Hyperion is to come up with a credible design for manned interstellar spacecraft based on near-term technologies. And uh, we basically try to do the same as uh, the Daedalus team did for uh, an unmanned spacecraft. We try to do the same for a manned spacecraft. And of course, uh, this is a huge challenge because you have a very complex element within your system, which is uh, humans, and therefore you have to tackle a range of problems uh, to which we don't have any answer currently. So one of these uh, issues is, for instance, population size. So what is the minimum population size you, you must have on board? And this is a very complex issue because it depends on biology, um, genetics, um, how do you uh, transmit knowledge, uh, how do you hedge for uh, risk or how do you mitigate risk um, to your population, etc. Um, then, of course, um, you have to think about different mission architectures. So do you send an unmanned precursor probe to the star system in order to um, build or construct colonies within um, the star system before the humans arrive, etc. So we went through various uh, mission architectures, mapped out the trade space. Uh, there's currently um, one of our team members is working on a journal paper dealing with a specific problem of population size. And we also published, as a first result, a JBS paper, uh, which is called World Chips, um, Architectures and Feasibility um, Revisited, which was published in 2012. Um, it's available online, a uh, preprint uh, version of the paper is available online and everybody uh, is free to download it. As uh, future steps, so now after we've mapped out um, our trade space, our mission architectures, of course the next step is to, to down select um, within this uh, trade space, design space, and then to design our first mission elements. So how does a habitat look like um, for manned interstellar purposes? How does an automated manufacturing uh, facility look like in order to maybe produce or construct colonies within the target star system? And of course, what type of propulsion system are we going to use? And we are specifically looking forward for synergies between other projects um, within Project Icarus. So I think these are very exciting topics and most of them haven't been addressed in a serious manner before. And we have an international team, a multidisciplinary team, um, consisting of architects, ant anthropologists, uh, medical doctors, engineers, physicists. And I think there are exciting times to come. Thank you. Hi. Persephone is about life, how we make it, how we sustain it. And the project is not separate from all the other experiments that are going on in Icarus Interstellar, but is necessarily interdependent and informed and reinformed by them. Um, we have a large group of collaborators. Um, they will be on the Icarus Interstellar website, but they include the Avatar Research Group at the University of Greenwich, which is a group of research architects. Um, it includes Sustainable Now Technologies, which is um, uh, a group of engineers based in California, and, and many other um, partners. 
Um, we've been holding events, um, so we've had Future Cities 2 event, which was held at the University of Greenwich this year, um, where we, again, were building research partnerships um, with um, artists in Holland. Uh, Sarah Jane Pell joined the community there. And, of course, Rob Swinney and uh, Richard Osborne, who are from uh, uh, the uh, Icarus team, um, are, you know, also came and, uh, you know, shared their wisdom with us. So, I mean, it was an extremely exciting time and, um, you know, the University of Greenwich is very supportive of what we're doing um, and we've actually been getting further um, funds to you know, seed this project. Um, but there is a strategy and a vision for the progression of um, Persephone and that is really because it's, uh, you know, because I guess my current discipline is based in, in architecture. The idea is to literally prototype starship technologies within our current cities. So I would like people to have sustainable architectures that are really you know, pushing the limits of starship design within the field of sustainability. And so, for example, we may just be starting a project with the Elephant and Castle with Lend-Lease, um, which will be about using algae ponics um, in order to uh, fuel um, transport um, sustainably. Um, we will also be developing facades that, again, will you know, eat their surroundings and produce um, food and fuel for buildings. So, I mean, essentially, you know, Persephone is not just about a starship, it's about the way we live. And it is manifest through architecture. Um, and that means we're actually working with industry right now and working on a future food, pro food project with Unilever. Um, and we're also um, uh, you know, looking for um, uh, uh, co-funded um, uh, enterprise, so like the Technology Strategy Board, where universities work together with industry to um, seed innovation. So we'll actually be making prototypes that are actually usable in our cities right now. Um, and that really will be the mainstay of how Persephone um, uh, really builds itself. And we will have an algae ponics research unit on the university building in 2014, and sustainable technologies are now um, currently building that. It's going to be craned on top of this new building that's got about five football pitches worth of green roof. So that's actually going to be a lot of fun for our students. Um, and so, essentially, you know, by next year, we'll hope that we'll have built a, a community around the Black Sky Thinking Prize. We'll have appointed our judges formally. As I mentioned, Warren Ellis will be one of those judges. Um, and we'll be holding Future Cities 3, which, again, will incorporate starship elements um, around the theme of abundance. Um, and uh, really, this is a long-term vision. And even if I never get to build the world ship, if I can turn every city into a starship, that would be an achievement. Riveting. Riveting. Um, I, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Project Tintin also, before I forget. Uh, I already gave a, a talk uh, yesterday or two days ago. Um, but uh, there's a couple of things that, that, uh, that were left off specifically, you know, where are we right now with the development of this project, what was the idea and where exactly are we going, like wh what, is, what is the grand vision for this. So when we started Tintin, uh, it started, like I said, it was as a mistake and uh, most things I do start as mistakes. Um, but as soon as, as soon as we saw that, we thought, I, I thought that, that Icarus Interstellar needs, uh, needs a hardware design um, arm. We need to solidify something, so something that, that, that transmits to the rest of the world the, how serious we are about, about what we're doing. And uh, I think one of the ideas, wh one of the things that's really pushed me over the edge to, to, to get the project started and, and to really commit a lot of time into it was, uh, was a presentation that I gave to, uh, um, was a public presentation that I gave at a school, and there were there were several there were several parents there and and things like that, and we were just talking about education and space exploration and, and things, and several people who were businessmen approached me afterwards, and he says and they said you know it's a really good idea we're talking about Icarus and Icarus Interstellar was a really good idea, but it's way too far into the future, it's never going to touch us, um, the, the the likelihood of it of it affecting anything on the planet you know, is, is so minimal that, that it's really difficult for someone to invest in it. And by investment, we mean both financial and, and intellectual, and also in, in terms of our intention span itself. So, uh, 
so we looked at so we looked at getting these really small really small spacecraft up in, into orbit so that as a as a team regardless of what the collective experience of our members is because several of several of our team members have sent things up into space and have contributed to, to space pro programs like most of us on the panel have uh, we wanted to do it specifically for Icarus Interstellar and the reason again why we chose CubeSats is because it's closest to uh, to fulfilling our expectations for the next generation so CubeSats are spacecraft were really easily accessible to students and if we can Im give these students uh, an extremely difficult task to take this small little cube and maybe add two or three or twelve cubes you know, whichever way you want to scale them but give them the task of extracting every single kilometer per second in in delta v and every single you know volt or power usage in their in their space systems as they can we have to task people with incredible problems to solve in order for for us to see transcending capabilities and this is absolutely central to what we're doing here in at Icarus Interstellar um, and uh, even scratching the surface of this field you know gives you gives you some some really really interesting um, avenues to pursue so it is it is probably by now the, the, the biggest joke that that you know the Voyager spacecraft had computers that were far less powerful than like a digital watch and um, we have incredibly powerful computers right now, but they're not radiation hardened. They haven't been space proven. Uh, some people claim that the power is excessive, that we actually, because it's a dedicated system, we don't need that much power up there. Um, but um, what happened to taking risks? Like what happened to taking like really far out risks? Like we are going into, we are going into space, even if we're just exploring near space right now, because we want to advance to far deep space. What happened to taking risks? What happened to, to walking into someone's, someone's research lab and saying, you know, you just developed a thermovoltaic system that I know it doesn't work well, but you're giving two, us 2% 2 better efficiency, for instance. I want to put it up on a CubeSat right now and launch it, and I don't care if it fails in a week. I do not care if it fails, but I want to space prove this. And uh, that's how the, the naming for the, the Tintin mission came. And I know it's kind of a, like I said, it was a tongue in cheek, but the idea started with the, with the notion of, of using Altoid tins. Like how small can we make a spacecraft? And take an Altoid tin and send it up into space. And I want to I wanna really, really compactify all of the technology into just the size of an Altoid tin. And I saw quickly that just the propulsion system, like without a propulsion system. So then I would send one tin, I would send another tin, and eventually, I'd get to seven, eight, nine, or ten tins, and then, and then I started, <laughs> and then I just tripped my tongue. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, so it's really a scaling experiment because uh, if you remember from some of my graphs, we saw that for really small power, we can get really small ISP, but the more power you have, it's power per weight, right? It's always power per weight, it's thrust per weight power per weight, ISP per weight, like the, the, the timeline goes up on, on an exponential curve, much like the exponential curves that we see in technology. So if someone has a tin that's this big, who says that within 50 years it can't be like an, an enormous cube, for instance? I don't necessarily want it to be a Borg cube, but that I, I, can't, I can't avoid that visual right now. If, if it's a big, if it's a bigger cube, if, if it's just a scaling experiment, then why can't we scale it? Um, this, uh, this work was published in, in uh, the International Astronomical Congress last year and uh, the, the reviewer uh, asked for, uh, 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 they didn't really want to touch the, the paper but they just said we, we would really enjoy like some closing arguments as to what the purpose of this is because it's such a long term mission. 25,000 years, like my claim is, I'm going to achieve a 25,000 year mission to Alpha Centauri. And to, to many of us in the room, we'll say, well, you know, what have you really achieved? Like, is that really an achievement? Like, you're saying that you're going to send something to Alpha Centauri, but it's going to take 25,000 years, whereas something else is taking 75,000 years? Like, is that really an accomplishment? And uh, the, the thing that came to my head instantly was, was catch me if you can. <laughs> catch me, catch me if you can. Like, let's put a mark out there. Let's say that there's a far outlying boundary 
that the next interstellar explorers have to pass. And my final, our final comment on, the, on that paper was that we fully intend for Project, for, for Project Tintin, for the Tintin spacecraft, to be the first interstellar vehicle to ever be overcome on the way to Alpha Centauri. Um, and uh, in terms again of, of how we're uh, how we're applying this, just a few uh, a few words of, of how we're developing this. Um, we we are an international team, and we thrive on this international um, footprint that we that we've spread out. And uh, we've had several thoughts of pulling together a team and everyone just coming to Dallas to work all the time and, and things like that. And I have my own personal opinions of this. I quite like living in Anchorage, you know, and I quite like the fact that, that Richard is in, is in uh, Texas kind of thing and, and that Rachel is in, is in England and everyone is spread all over in Germany, in Greece, everywhere all over the world, India, Australia. Like, aren't we touching more people just by interacting with the people around us? Like, let's spread out more. But how do you do development, right? So, uh, so with a skip and a throw, you know who does development uh, without, while being able to circumvent certain night hour restrictions and the amateur radio. Uh, well, let's just, let's just cut to the chase. Well, makerspaces do things like this all the time. So. Uh, so very quickly, we motivated uh, a team up in Anchorage, and, and Icarus Interstellar sponsored the formation of the of the Anchorage Makerspace. And the Anchorage Makerspace is tasked with doing uh, spacecraft engineering, hardware hacking in any form they can. And uh, we already, although we we just did this in February, we already had a Maker Fair, and uh, the guys made a made a pulse jet engine. And I wish I could I could put a Push, put, pull a, uh, a photo of it up, but it's a big, ugly thing. And they they said we want to make some kind of thruster, and this is the easiest kind of thruster that we can make. And it's a pulse jet engine, and it makes a lot of noise, and it's really scary looking. Um, so uh, so we hope that that by by working through these maker spaces, that we can parallelize and serialize the, the development of these small spacecraft while keeping it central to Icarus and just like the, for the design. But uh, we've got far-reaching, you know, sort of ideas and plans. And uh, something that that's inspired me from uh, that inspired me from one of the farm maker um, competitions was was the runner-up actually to to the to the winner, which was that Life Star. Um, and I thought that, uh, and I thought of terrariums, and terrariums are like self-contained units. I've done a little bit of research in that. They're they're remarkable. There's people that have hold, held terrariums alive for for about you know, 50 years and above. And uh, why couldn't we put a terrarium on a CubeSat? It doesn't have to be a manned CubeSat, right? A manned spacecraft, but we can have a terrarium on a CubeSat testing an ecosystem. And uh, that would be a really, really fun thing, really, really fun thing to do. Um, we, uh, I would like to, to turn over our panel to questions from, uh, from the audience now, please. Really quickly, have you seen yet uh, the talk that Freeman Dyson did at the Starship Century uh, conference, uh, Noah's Ark's Eggs, Ark Eggs, uh, Andreas, because he talks about that very idea. Terrariums in first near Earth orbit and then farther and farther out. He gets into some far out territory, but uh, I think you guys are on the same wavelength. Uh, let me let me reply to that. Uh, his idea was is that uh, there is interesting. He designed a sort of a possible life form to live in the outer solar system. Uh, that were really quite interesting. And the thing that struck uh, my brother and I about it uh, was that it, it's an observable. You could actually observe the l reflection from these essentially corner of a reflector type devices. Uh, which would be f focusing uh, sunlight on themselves. They'd be like flowers. Uh, and he, it, Dyson had done the numbers, and, and we looked at it and decided that, I, that it might be observable. So I, we got together with my son, who's an astronomer, Dominic Benford, and we've come up with a way to observe it. 
uh, from existing telescopes. And we asked Dyson, uh, have you ever heard of anybody trying to do this? And he said, well, no, no one's ever taken the idea up. So we're going to try to get funding if we can look for those life forms in the outer solar system. Things are synergistic, aren't they? Dr. Messerschmidt. Just to introduce another idea and put a bug in your ear, the one word, children. I think that one of the problems we have, especially in the developed countries, is interesting young, getting young people interested in science and engineering. And I think this particular topic and challenge could be really exciting one that children would really engage in, or young people more generally. So I, I would urge you all to think about how you might, if you don't already have, an auxiliary program that specifically is oriented toward involving young people in the excitement of what you're doing? Uh, I can answer that, actually. Um, we've, and, and this, is, this is something on my shoulder, so um, at, uh, at DARPA 2011, I, I presented a paper um, called Education in Interstellar Engineering, at the Space, Space Starflight Academy. And this vision of the Starflight Academy, what we presented in the paper was, uh, was the, the motivations, the stakeholders, like why, why would you conceive of, a, of an educational institution that is dedicated to interstellar exploration? And it's relevant to everything that we're talking about here. Like we, we want the vision for it with the curriculum that's presented in the paper is to present students with the most difficult problems. So give them an equation, put them in the lab, give them a piece of hardware, say this is the nominal behavior of the system. Can you? Uh, can you improve this by an order of magnitude or else you don't get your degree? Like, see what happens. Seriously, see what happens. My, my son took some Legos and b built a bridge. Like, he, he's never seen a bridge before. He, he took some Legos and he built the bridge. He's three years old. Like, he's, he doesn't know how to do this, but he figured out how to build the bridge out of Legos. And, I, and I, I've taken like maybe 5,000 photos of it. Question, please. I would like to ask a question: How with beamed solar or with beamed cells can we achieve manned flights to other solar systems, or can we only use it for probes, and maybe bring bacteria or very small? payloads to another solar system. So is it really possible to send a crew of people that um, that's the way uh, this solar or the sails, this beam what is it called here? Beamed here sail ships to another solar system. Is that real or is it remaining science fiction? And why would that be better than bomb propulsion? fusion bomb propulsion, ignition of small fusion explosions with intense beams of particles. I can take uh, <laughs> that question. Um, I think that um, whether or not this is realistic is um, a difficult question to answer because there's no single answer to that. You have to take into account different factors. What I think is, uh, you mentioned solar sails and um, nuclear fusion propulsion, and these two options are basically also the options we consider within Project Hyperion. So we try to come up with a design which is feasible from today's point of view from a technolo technological perspective. However, of course, we are aware of the fact that uh, the resources needed for such a mission um, exceed uh, the capabilities of uh, the human civilization today. So um, these are two different aspects. Yeah. Oh, okay, from what I understand from forwards presentations for that uh, sale propulsion scheme. He would need a laser as big as the state, state of Texas. Whereas for bomb propulsion, what only we need is we need to show that 
thermonuclear micro-explosion ignition is possible. Now Livermore of course failed. The reason why Livermore failed is because laser fusion was oversold and with two megajoule energy you cannot ignite a thermonuclear micro-explosion. So, but here is definitely something we can do because we must only make it bigger. The bigger, the better, the bigger, but it doesn't have to be as big as the state of Texas. That is what you would need according to forward's proposal for cell, uh, for cell propulsion. How would you respond to that? Um, so s since, um, since the publication of forward's paper in 84, uh, considerable progress has been made in this area and I would say um, the size of the aperture you need for um, the laser has been decreased quite significantly and also the material which forward proposes within this paper um, there are other materials like um, car carbon nanotubes, graphene, nanomaterials, etc. And I would say that considerable progress has been made to, um, to decrease um, the size of, of the system, of the laser system. However, what I would point out is that the laser system has the advantage that um, there are synergies with other applications. So you don't really build a laser system only for interstellar mission purposes, you build a laser system in conjunction with uh, solar power satellites, etc. So uh, I see, I think um, the argument here is rather which system has sufficient synergies to provide value not only to an interstellar mission but also to human civilization. Yeah. Thank you guys for your uh, sharing your vision and your passions and your projects. Uh, this it's a lot of fun. It's like solid science with some kind of wild ass speculation that's very productive and, and I, I, I love it. It reminds me a little bit of a Singularity Summit. But one thing I noticed throughout the conference and I've had a chance to, to speak to you about it, I see many applications for artificial intelligence, both narrow AI and accelerating your current projects and long-term AI, how we develop code of ethics for the very variety of cognitive architectures we would encounter perhaps on Earth in the form of AI. Uh, before aliens. So how important do you think the role is of AI, current automated systems to research, narrow AI that exists now, uh, big data, many different forms, and then also long-term cognitive um, sentient AI, and are you open to more uh, artificial intelligence researchers and computer scientists participating in the project? I'm not, I'm not sure that question is relevant to, this, to the subject of the, the projects, the, but uh, you know, we can have a conversation about that about that afterwards. It's been covered at times throughout. So I'll allow one next one another question. Hi, uh, this is mainly I think for you, Andres. Um, uh, I like uh, your project of starting small with the tin tin, the tin. That's cool. Um, over the past maybe a couple of years ago, there was a project with a balloon and a camera that. Uh, got a lot of media attention. I think it was very interesting to see how far they could get with just a weather balloon, like $50 worth of materials. Um, I guess my question is, like, can you, do you think you could ever hybridize that at all or we, any kind of thing like that? We, we, have a, we have a project to do exactly that with the, at the Anchorage Makerspace, but uh, with, the added, um, with the added sort of trick that, that the return vehicle is re retrieving it is always a problem because you can't get the data. So we're we're gonna glide back. So we're gonna have build a spacecraft. We're gonna build an aircraft onto it, like an RC aircraft, which we have a big population of fan, uh, fans and fanatics actually of uh, within our makerspace. So so we're gonna send it up, make some observations, do something silly, and then and then come come and glide down and hopefully have have it land so that you don't have to search for it. So uh, this is th things like this are. are Absolutely wonderful, and and they can be done on such small scales. And you can you can you can do it once. You can refine it, and it's exactly what we, what we were discussing earlier. You can take it to a group of students and say, "Can you make this go higher? Can you get make this work a little bit better?" So yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, I want to end this particular panel session right now and uh, invite uh, Mr. Mike Mongo, who's uh, who's become a really dear friend of mine over the last. Uh, is it just six months? I think we I think we can't really realize we don't understand how long we've known each other because we feel so uh, we feel so friendly. Please come up, come up and talk to us about building a start. Thank you.
starting my timer. Apparently, I hear that I can just keep on going, and uh, which is fine with me. But I'm sure we all have places to be, airlines to catch. There's a tweet I just caught a second ago. I'm going to bring up. Ah, there it is. My name, ah, uh, my name is Mike Mongo, and I'm an astronaut teacher. And I'm here for a very special reason today. I'm here to address all the attendees at the first ever summit of interstellar space exploration scientists, science advocates, science organizations, researchers, artists. And I'm also here to remind everyone, well, why we are here. And how we can accomplish this goal that we've set out for ourselves, which is pre pretty clearly outlined with Build a Starship. A lot of times people ask me, Mr. Mongo, how did you become an astronaut teacher? And in my case, I tell them, well, I just started walking around and telling people, hi, my name is Mike Mongo, and I'm an astronaut teacher. And that's part of, that's, that, that's exactly part of it, actually. When I was working with, uh, as I've gone on in life, one of the things I discovered, I, I learned, was that discovery leads to transformation. And when I would see kids engage with science and science-related matters, occasionally there was a person who would catch on to something, and right before your eyes, they would evolve. Now, now, here's a really, really interesting thing about this conference, about the summit. There's four people in the room that, that may hold the future in their hands. Uh, could you stand up when I call your name? Andy Hatch, Logan Patrick, Zach, Zach Young, and James Wright. Uh, uh, <laughs> Fellas, this is the first and last time you'll get applauded for being young. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> right on, brother. Thank you. The reason I have them stand up is because it, it's all of these brilliant people in the audience here. How many of us took the time to introduce ourselves to the people in the room who are under 18? How many of us geniuses? I see a show of hands and I appreciate it. It wasn't as many, it wasn't all of us, is my point. When I'm out and about anywhere in the world and I travel around and I, and I have the luxury or the benefit or the good fortune to go and address classrooms of people regularly, even if I'm not in a classroom setting, I'm at the grocery store, because of what I do, and I see a young person in front of me, that I will stop and I will say, how are you doing? Inevitably, they say, good. And, th and then I ask them, what does that mean to you? I don't let them off the hook. And then I ask them what they want to be. And that's the most important thing. The, there was a tweet that I just saw a second ago. General impression of Starship Con. After four days, mostly a community of enthusiasts with no current roadmap for a path forward. Well, well that's how I became um, Mike Mongo astronaut teacher. I wrote the book, Mike Mongo's Astronaut Instruction Manual for Preteens. But there's a, t a saying that I teach to kids, be as careful at the end as at the beginning. So you may perceive that what we've been doing here is, is a whole lot of running in place, but maybe you should wait for the best part. And it could be right now. Voyager, for instance, is going out to the end of the universe and the end of its cycle. But that's sort of the big thing for us, isn't it? I would like to play a game. And that game is called Build a Starship. So in address to that tweet, it's a bunch of enthusiasts who have no clear plan. Well, I have a plan. 
and you're part of it. Who has a wristband on? Who has a t-shirt? Anyone get a mug? This is not just a slogan. This is, this is a goal. And it's our job to communicate it to all the kids that we see. We, the ones who know and the ones who have been classified as, as credible witnesses, fair witnesses, experts, we have to stop every niece and nephew and cousin, son and daughter, neighborhood kid, and say these magic words, you're going to build a starship. Have you thought about being an astronaut? Are you good at science? If we're not saying that every single day, then, then that's, that's where we move to. That's the clear path. It isn't about, uh, you'll pardon me, it isn't about building the Daedalus right now. That's not attainable. But what we can do is inspire the next generation with this information. We are going to provide you the tools to build a starship. We're going to give you the research and the ways and the means. We are going to make sure that you have the education necessary to achieve this. That's our job. When I hear people talking about, this is my, when I hear this, Oh, this generation, all they do is text. They're, they're connecting, they're communicating, they're, they're messaging. They're not failing. They're using the tools that we provide. How we got here today is by using the tools that the generation prior to all of us gave us. So if anything's wrong with the generation that's coming up right now, uh, it's us. This game has rules, like every good game. Rule number one, no copyright of build a starship. No trademark of build a starship. And anyone may use build a starship as <laughs> with, with this bonbon, you must attribute where it came from. You can even capitalize on Build a Starship, but you must say it where it came from. This is called a Creative Commons license. I, I hope everyone's familiar with Creative Commons. Copyright and trademark is, is one of the scourges that keep us back right now. Big money and lawyers use it to prevent everyone having access to the same resources. So what we've done at Icarus Interstellar is create a resource for everyone to use. Next rule, I call this the field rule because I got it from my good friend, Buck Field. Do whatever you believe will accomplish the goal of building a starship to the best of your abilities. There was the talk about how we need to unite and then there was the, disagree the, the uh, opinion that we don't need to unite. If you feel like uniting is the most important thing, then unite. And if you feel like going off and doing your own thing is the most important thing, then go off and do it. But the, but the absolute most important thing is do it to the best of your abilities. And rule number three, and I love this for this room. Never mind who gets the credit. Keep your eye on the prize. I'm gonna give you an example. And it, and it pertains to this. In, in 1992, I started working with an organization called Andre the Giant Has a Posse. It's an, it's an art movement. And in 1994, we got a letter from Titan Sports, who owned WWF, that explained to us that Andre the Giant is a copyrighted property and to stop cease and desist. So we changed it. We had already been saying obey giant in our art campaign and I was young and I was just following my passion. 
And Michael Minovich, by the way, took the time to explain to the 15-year-old, Logan Martin, took the time, stopped his day and said, here's what you have to do to succeed. You find what's in your heart that you love most of all and you move it to your head. When we started, when we started Andre the Giant, it was just fun. It was just something we, we did. We put up stickers, posters, wristbands, see a trend? And then it kept on going and, then it, and it became popular enough to develop a clothing line and skateboards and accessories and then uh, $250 sweaters in Macy's. And then in 2007, the Obey organization, which I co-founded, got a call from an organization that we weren't so familiar with, but they were running this man for president named Barack Obama. And they asked us to develop an image. And you may have seen it. You may have seen the image. It says hope at the bottom. The point is that I'm not just coming, I'm not proposing an idea. The first thing we did, obey, was an experiment. The second thing, hope, was an application of, of, the, of the, what we learned from the experiment. And the third one is that we're going to take that from 92 to 2008. That's what it took to get President Barack Obama elected. I understand that. We use the exact same practices. We pasting posters in, in, in city, cities, passing out stickers. It was, it was person to person. It was completely grassroots. And guess how we're going to build a starship? This exact way. This is the way. We don't start with fusion engines. We start with kids. We start with a, a, a slogan that everybody can use. And you don't have to worry that who came up with it or who owns it or, or, or any of those details because those are what hold us back. One of the things we developed at Icarus, and you've heard a whole bunch about recently, to pursue this goal is something called Farmaker. And what you may or may not know is that we base the name Farmaker off Olaf Stapledon's seminal science fiction work, Far, a Star Maker. And Star Maker is one of the first references of interstellar space travel anywhere. So it's homage to the shoulders that we stand upon. When we started Farmaker, it was two years ago. It wasn't called Farmaker, and we thought about building video games. That was the goal. We said, okay, so how do we connect with, with the youth? Let's build video games. But that would be like a video game designer going and saying, let's build rocket ships, which may or may not, well, I mean, if you ask John Carmack, that's not necessarily a good idea. But we evolved. We languished, we came up, we went down, and, we became, and then we realized, you know what? All these people are doing what they love, and we're doing what we love, so what we should do, here's what we should do. We should encourage the content creators and the media makers to in, include the name and idea, the name Icarus Interstellar on their spaceships, and the idea, build a starship in their materials, permeate it through the, bubble it through the media, bubble it through the content, comic books, video games, movies, and it's happening. It is happening. They don't have to pay for rights. And now those organizations are coming to us and, and saying, can you give us the science about this project that we're creating? Can you make sure that we got it right? So Farmaker is starting to generate capital for Icarus Interstellar. Oh, I had a beautiful picture here. Why, have human being, why do human beings do, this is, this is what I tell, tell people all the time, because I hear robots and I hear AI and hear, hear, hear that's not gonna inspire the people that I work with. The people that I work with are eight to 12. And, and if I tell them that they're gonna plug their brain into a robot, maybe. But if I tell them that I'm giving you the tools and, and all, my, all my peers are gonna provide you with the necessary tools to build a starship so that, the, so that the generation after you can use it, but you get to build it, it's gonna be like Legos or Minecraft. They're stoked, which means excited. <laughs> this is what I want everybody to take. 
15 minutes on the dot, baby. <laughs> Take this. Spread it around. I passed out st uh, stickers to people that I think will put them up. Other, other people have collected them because they know they'll put them up. Use build a starship. It's ours. There's a couple people I have to thank. Buckfield, I swear to goodness, we wouldn't be here without him today. Heath Rezebeck, I have three arms. Heath is the third. Luke Blaze, he's, he's the video game designer with Dr. Andreas Tiziolis, who started the project which became Farmaker. Dr. Richard Obusi, talk to me on the telephone. My wife, for letting me be here, and I hope you all know who Benton Quest is. Johnny Quest dad. Thank you very much. Build a starship. Folks, about 20 minutes ago, my uh, stomach started rumbling, so we're happy to know this is, uh, this is a fairly short presentation. We can then all um, break for lunch. So I've been to um, a number of um, interstellar conferences over the last few years. Um, and what I noticed is you build up a lot, of, a lot of gravitas, a lot of momentum, the people are dynamic. But you know, when the conference ends, people are kind of like, well, what next? How can I get involved? How can I be a part of this? And so I've been thinking about this for the last few weeks. I've been thinking, how can we end the first Starship Congress? Not on a note, thanks a lot, we'll see you in two years, but hey, we've got a plan. We've got a plan for how to, how to involve those of you who aren't already involved um, in Icarus Interstellar. And I want to present just the, the early stages um, of the idea uh, that, I've, that I've been thinking about. And, Really, it's how do we build a crowdsourced community um, devoted to advancing um, interstellar flight. And I, I want to start using, I want to use Icarus Interstellar as a model that we can scale. Icarus Interstellar is a volunteer organization of about 100 people. And if, we, we've been remarkably productive. So um, uh, over the last two years, we've had over 30 peer-reviewed publications, over 60 conferences. We've been in countless media appearances, in including New York Times, Discovery, BBC News. We have an active student program, variety of Starship studies, which you've helped, uh, heard about today. But how can we scale that? Instead of 100 volunteers, how can we make that 100,000 volunteers? So I think it's a case that we don't just need volunteers, but we need leaders. We get a lot of emails. We get a lot of people saying, hey, I want to I get involved. Um, and a number of us on the organization um, have spent a huge amount of time. Uh, it's, it's fantastic having volunteers, but it's not just a case of, okay, you know, we give, a, give a quick phone call and then they're off. I mean, volunteers, take a, take, it takes a lot of communication to really get volunteers going. And so we don't just need volunteers. We need leaders to volunteer for Icarus Interstellar. Those with the capacity to self-organize and build teams and work toward our common objectives. And so we have a website, uh, Starship Congress, and over the next month or two, I want to turn this into a portal, a super portal, um, so that people can really start to get engaged with what we're doing. And so what kind of teams do we need? How can we take what we've got and amplify that and scale that? And I think very broadly speaking, we need people to help us with the research. We need people to help us with the fundraising. We need people to help us with technology projects. We need people to help us with education, outreach, and even gaming. Why do I put gaming up there? Because I discovered recently that 98% of under 18 year olds spend more time playing video games each week than they do at school. That's not something to be worried about. That's something to embrace. That's something for us to figure out. How can we engage the gaming community as well? And so the kind of vision I've got developing for this website is that we'd have two recruitment channels. You'd come to the website and you know, you'd, be, you'd say, OK, there'd be a link at the top, volunteer. And you'd be presented with a sequence of options, a sequence of decisions, which would progressively bin you, for lack of a, a more inspirational word, into, into the areas that you can help. 
And so, you know, you would start off with um, volunteer for the program manager, which would be that leadership role, the person with the ability to self-organize and build teams around them. Or you could volunteer for actually executing the program, helping to execute the vision of the project manager. And then you'd go forward and select your preferred area of focus, research, fundraising, technology, education, outreach, gaming. And this is just, this is just like I said, the, the, the nucleus of an idea. There may be more. It's certainly not meant to be an exhaustive um, strategy that I'm presenting. And of course, there'd be one of these nice hyperlinks underneath so you can understand what you're getting into. And the role of the program manager, so their, their, their role, uh, so for the example, let's say you're interested um, in research. We can continue to bifurcate that. Okay, so what kind of research do we need to make progress in interstellar flight? So again, not exhaustive, but habitats, propulsion, economics, the kind of thing that uh, Dr. Papazian is talking about, communications, exotic propulsion, materials, target systems, energy generation, and so forth. So we continue to, to bifurcate out from research and, and get more detailed. So the role of the program manager, that, that leader, would, be, would involve, one, identifying a program from this broader bin. Two, generating mission statements and a statement of work that really articulates what that research project wants to accomplish. Then, because you'd have other volunteers who would say, okay, I'm interested in communications, the role of the, progr the, the program manager would be to pick, pick that team from, from, from that bin and then go forth over the next six months and execute the statement of work. And, and what I'm thinking is that once that, research, once that research has been completed, that can be submitted publicly to the Starship Congress uh, website, uh, and, and the team will be invited to present uh, at Starship Congress um, 2015. And so the other side of the team, the team member, would execute that, that statement of work. And you can imagine this for the, for the range of categories that, that, we're in, that we need help with. So for the fundraising, you can imagine the program manager would be select, uh, responsible for selecting um, an area of expertise from these kinds of example, email campaigns, traditional philanthropy, compelling Kickstarter campaigns. I mean, we had a wonderful Kickstarter campaign. Can we duplicate that for some of the other projects and programs we want to execute? Um, and so what I'm thinking at this stage is that for the fundraising, the proceeds would go uh, toward projects uh, that advance the field of interstellar flight. We could divert a fraction of any fundraising to the next Starship Congress. For technology, that includes things like web development, a virtual Starship, uh, SEO. That's how people find us on Google. That's how, that's how people navigate in the world, the virtual world these days. Um, education, we need people to create syllabuses, uh, syllabus for, uh, for, for schools and universities uh, that are interstellar themed. Um, online training, identification of, of potential teacher opportunities, and, and what, what happens if you get a qualification in interstellar studies? What can you do after that? Um, and, and guest speaking at schools for outreach. We've got a great outreach program, but it could be better. We need writers, videographers, bloggers, artists, speakers, animators, press releases to engage in this mimetic offensive almost to get people inspired by, by our vision. And for gaming, we need people who can help us create educational games, apps. We've got exciting things coming up on the horizon. Let's start thinking about what we can do with Google Glass, a kind of a visor so you don't even have to use your thumb to navigate your iPad. You just use your retina. So, uh, augmented reality and modified reality. So these are all the things that uh, we want to start thinking about that we need people to help with. So here's the big picture. Our vision is to crowdsource a variety of disciplines while we raise Ultimately, the long-term goal is to raise the funds to build the NASA of interstellar flight, for the lack of a better analogy. Um, and I believe that volunteers, and, and, it, and what we've accomplished today and what we've accomplished with Icarus Interstellar, I believe that volunteers can accomplish meaningful and influential work. And uh, like I said, our, our, I believe our volunteers to date uh, demonstrate that. And so we intend over the coming weeks and months to build that web portal, that interface for you here today if you're not a part of Icarus Interstellar or if you're watching on the internet uh, and, and engage a large population to crowdsource R&D um, into Interstellar Flight. Thank you very much. Pardon? Okay, there's a lot of people I want to thank um, for really bringing this together. Um, and as we you know, bring this to a close, um, first I want to really 
uh, thank those who are helping out at the registration desk. So that was uh, Jennifer Buchanan, um, uh, Sue Ann uh, Kitcher, uh, and Andrew Hatch. I want to thank all of our speakers and pay special recognition to our keynote speakers, Dr. Jim Benford, uh, Dr. Pavel Shvetkov, Dr. Rachel Armstrong, Dr. Friedwart Winterberg, uh, Dr. Michael Minovich, Kelvin Long, Dr. Sonny White, and Stefan Martin. Yeah. Um, I also want to uh, recognize our special event speakers, Dr. Sarah Jane Pell. Uh, Dr. Peter Garretson, and also the stakeholder stage, Mark Millis, Dr. Joe Ritter, Paul Gilster, David Sheehan, uh, David Weiss. I want to say thanks again to CCP Games, who are our corporate sponsor, and an extra special thanks once again to the Kickstarter supporters. This would have been incredibly, incredibly, incredibly difficult for us to put on if it wasn't for your profound generosity. I'm eternally grateful. Uh, I want to say a quick thank you to our session chairs, Dr. Ian O'Neill, Dr. Rachel Armstrong, again, Haley Bright, Tiffany Frierson, who co-chaired uh, with uh, Dr. Eric Davis, Dr. Uh, Gerald Cleaver, Dr. Uh, Donna Dulo, Robert Freeland, uh, Dr. Andreas Ciolis. I also want to say a huge thank you um, to Anu Bowman, uh, who, was, uh, who likes to be called Madam, Madam Secretary. She was the first Secretary General of the first uh, General Assembly of Starship Congress. Um, I want to say a special thank you uh, to the directors of Icarus Interstellar, many of whom actually injected their own cash to help fund this. That's uh, uh, Robert Freeland, Rob Swinney, Dr. Andreas Ciolis, uh, Bill Kress, um, and Adam Crowell. Um, but I want to pay an extra special recognition uh, to about a dozen people and recognize their contributions who over the last seven months really pulled this together, and that's the Starship Congress Planning uh, Committee. So uh, if I call your name, I'd like you to just come up to the stage and please uh, save your applause until the end. So first off, we've already got Mike Mongo here. He was our creative strategy director, and he was really the driving energy uh, behind uh, the success of our Kickstarter campaign. Um, also want to recognize uh, Steve Summerford. He couldn't be here, but with the help of his wife, Whitney, he actually created the video. Um, Dr. Eric Davis, Gerald Cleaver, and Adam Crowell, who served as technical chairs. Uh, Tiffany Frierson, who was the head of accessibility. Uh, Bill Cress, who was the director of operations and production. Haley Bright, she's gone home, head of TV and production. Donna Dulo, is she still here? If so, please come up. Uh, she was the logistics chief and corporate sponsor point of contact. Uh, Robert Freeland, uh, he was the director of planning and schedule. Buck Fields, if you're here, please come up, program management advisor. Uh, Dr. Rachel Armstrong, outreach and planning. Rob Swinney, uh, outreach. John Maltzan, who was the chief blogger. Miles Gilster, uh, uh, he was the web developer and registrations. Heath, Heath Razorbeck, outreach and coordinator. Uh, Dr. Joe Ritter, outreach and consulting. Um, and Dr. Andreas Ciolis, outreach, graphics design, marketing, and 1,000 other, other roles. Folks, if it wasn't for these guys, this wouldn't happen. Thank you. I'm going to officially call to close the first Starship Congress and hope to see you in 2015. And thank you, Mark Zamora, for your wonderful work as well. Thank you.